Good afternoon. Welcome to Senate Finance. Today is Friday, March 10th, 2023. The committee has six bills for consideration today. We have 69 witnesses, so we're going to give the sponsors enough time to present their bills. We're going to give each of you two minutes. If you are here to speak on a bill, you'll have two minutes. Please be mindful of our timers. The, cons the committee's had a really long week. And so we ask that you try to hold to the two minutes. You'll see members coming in and out during the hearing. Many of them are presenting bills in other committees, so they mean no disrespect to you or your testimony if you see folks going in and out. The six bills that we will hear today will be heard in the following order. Senate Bill 562, 871, 872, 608. 509 and 584, subject to change. We're going to begin our hearings with Senate Bill 562, which is Maryland Small Food Bank's grant program establishment. Mr. Chairman, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee. Uh, good to be here. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to do it in less than two minutes. Um, so uh, uh, several months ago, I had a uh, smaller community food bank in, in our community say that they were having some issues with some with uh, with some staffing and 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 being able to keep running although they're doing tremendous work uh, matter of fact they're actually in senator lamb's district primarily uh the columbia uh community cares group um and um of course there's these smaller food banks all across the the state um and it turns out, interestingly enough, that I started hearing from some others. I heard one from one Baltimore City. I heard one in Prince George's County. And I started thinking, well, I, we can't just sort of fund one at a time these groups and give them sort of their own um, uh, line item, if you will. But maybe we should put together a program. And, and the bottom line is I want to help these entities that are all over our, our state, maybe with small grants, um, just to keep them going. They're they're volunteer operated in large ways, but um, but but uh, uh, you know, with a maybe even a ten or twenty thousand dollars, they could really um, uh, help um, pay for some a little bit of staffing to keep them running. They're doing tr tremendous work, as I know we all know, because we we have them in all of our communities. Um, so the bottom line was that uh, came up with this idea of just creating a grant program for these smaller um, food banks. Um, the bill before you has $3 million associated with it, but I put it in as not as a mandate. Um, uh, and uh, that's essentially it, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are there any questions for the bill sponsor? Yeah. Oh, by the way, one one thing real quick. I do have an amendment that I put in um, to just clarify. The idea is not to uh, many of these food banks um, rely a lot of times on the uh, generosity of a lot of different people, including the larger food banks. Um, this isn't for them to necessarily purchase food, um, which is uh, something that they they do do or they do receive from from various entities. This is really to help their sort of operational um uh work right and it's administered through dhs they yes. would apply and be able to then get approved for funding correct okay very good i don't see any questions from the committee so thank you very much for your testimony thank and that concludes the hearing on senate bill 562 colleagues we're now going to turn to senate bill 871 is senator washington here uh, not here. Let me go to Senator Vile. We wait. We'll give Senator Washington just another minute since we're all set up, and if she doesn't arrive, Senator Guile, get ready. <laughs> Are your folks here? Yeah. 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 Okay, let's do Senator Giles' bill, which is Senate Bill 584. 
public health, Parkinson's disease registry. Sorry for that. We'll get you all back up shortly. And Senator Guile, I see your panel coming up. So feel free to get started as soon as you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and fellow members of uh, the committee. Um, for the record, Senator Don Guile, District 33. Uh, so SB 584 establishes... Oh, my watch is talking. Sorry. <laughs> With apologies. <laughs> it's looking something up for me. Um, as, as SB 584 establishes a Parkinson's disease registry database, which is voluntary to patients. This registry will feed uh, de-identified patient information upon diagnosis to the State Department of Health and further to the Center for Disease Control, Centers for Disease Control for use in research, for planning for healthcare requirements, and for education of healthcare providers. For some background, I think we all generally know Parkinson's diseases, but it's a, a chronic neurodegenerative disease or chronic motor system disorder that gradually worsens over time. There's no treatment to slow, stop, or reverse the progression, nor is there a cure. Common symptoms include tremors, muscle rigidity, slowness of movement, impaired balance, and a shuffling gait. More than 1 million Americans, including 110,000 military veterans, live with Parkinson's disease. Beyond its impact on the people living with Parkinson's disease and their loved ones, the disease is costly to our society with an economic burden of $52 billion each year. The amount spent on research of the disease pales in comparison to the amount spent to care for people with Parkinson's, with the federal government spending $28 billion every year on care and only $180 million on research. The registry created by SB 584 will expand our understanding of Parkinson's disease to ultimately improve the lives of those affected. The registry will help identify high-risk groups, support patient contact studies, and serve as a valuable data resource to prevent and optimally manage Parkinson's disease. Researchers study patterns of Parkinson's disease over time. Uh, it'll help them to for help researchers to study patterns of Parkinson's disease over, over time, help to determine if certain regions of the state that use more pesticides have higher incidence of Parkinson's, help to improve our understanding of the link between Parkinson's and military service, since a large portion of the veterans community has Parkinson's compared to the general population. Six states have already created a state Parkinson's disease registry, including uh, California, Washington, and West Virginia, among others. Um, I'm also offering an amendment to the bill that would drastically reduce the fiscal impact of the bill, uh, as outlined in the fiscal note. Um, over the interim, um, MDH, CRISP, and other stakeholders met uh, pursuant to the bill passed on the topic in the last set legislative session, SB 740. Representatives from CRISP offered to integrate data collection on Parkinson's disease into their existing system, which means MDH would not need to create a new database to implement the registry. A final report that reflects this arrangement is expected to be published by MDH imminently, the amendment and the accompanying reprint that I'll be offering reflects that agreement. Uh, because the MDH would not need to collect the data for the registry, no additional staff would need to be hired, and no major infrastructure would need to be established to create the registry. CRISP has agreed to take on these responsibilities at no significant cost to the state. Upon adoption of the amendment, I expect a revised fiscal note to show a drastically reduced fiscal impact in the original one based on the existing text of the bill. Finally, I want to note that conversations with stakeholders are ongoing, and I'll be likely there'll be likely a, a final amendment uh, early next week um, before any potential committee vote. And I would respectfully request a favorable report with amendments on the on SB five eight four. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Julia Pitcher for the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. It is wonderful to be in front of you all again after so long. And I want to thank our senator sponsor um, for giving an excellent overview of what the registry would entail. Um, the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research was founded in 2000 with a singularly dedicated mission to find a cure for Parkinson's disease through aggressively funded research agenda and ensuring development of improved therapies for those living with PD today. And in fact, as Senator Guile said, um, there is a lack of funding in the federal government. There's a lack of advocacy across the country. And we have taken this on as one of the first Parkinson's organizations to have any legislative advocacy on the federal and the state side. And the reason why we picked 
registries is because it is directly related to our mission for research. So the idea as a concept is that is exactly as Senator Giles said, that the, that the department is not going to, based on the original draft of the bill with the reprint, and then we may have some subsequent amendments. So just Keep that in mind, we're trying to do everything possible to mitigate the fiscal note, but the long term, there's a short term goal, a medium goal and a long term goal. The short term goal is to see how many people actually live with Parkinson's in the state of Maryland today. Our estimates are anywhere between 17 and 22,000. We don't have a real good number on that, but that's some estimates that we have through some of our outside consultants. The long, the, the, so the short-term goal is to publish a yearly report that's easily downloadable from the website and not difficult to put together uh, to see how many live in are living currently in the state of Maryland and where are they. The medium long-term goal is to then have this data continue from the HI, the state's HIE, which is Chris, to go to the department and then have additional information that we could do more with for researchers in the state of Maryland. The long-term goal is to send this data up to the CDC where they have asked us the guidance that they have given us through the National Neurological Conditions Surveillance System is to pull all together with multiple states. We are currently doing this bill in nine states. We ask for a favorable report based on all the amendments that we're working on for next week's committee reporting deadline. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and committee members. My name is Larry Zarzecki. I'll be reading for AARP today and also as a Parkinson's patient. Um, Parkinson's is not only a motor skills issue, but it also affects non-motor symptoms. 40% of people like me with Parkinson's will will eventually will eventually will eventually um, become a dementia candidate 40 percent think about that so the so there is more to Parkinson's than just motor skills there are a lot of non-motor skills Lewy body dementia Alzheimer's and I believe what we will eventually see from this bill, if passed, will be the ability to project future outbreaks or reductions in Alzheimer's, dementia, autoimmune issues, et cetera. So for these reasons, I would ask that the committee give us a favorable vote. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Bill Pitcher here on behalf of the Michael J. Fox Foundation. I want to echo what uh, the sponsor and thank the sponsor for putting in the uh, bill. Um, as you know, we were here last year with uh, the bill as basically drafted again this year. It was um, turned into an advisory committee. The advisory committee of stakeholders of all sorts of uh, providers and activists in this field met during the summer, um, including with people from the department. And um, a presentation was made to them by CRISP, which is our health information exchange. Um, and they, all of a sudden, you know, lights went off when they said that we would like to try to help out with this. We think we can integrate our data collection into the, your concept here. Let's do it. We have been struggling last year and again this year with what the fiscal costs will be. We do know that in other states bigger than ours, their fiscal note is far less than what has been estimated here. Uh, but we're still struggling to try to get real data on this because it's a fairly new uh, endeavor and hasn't been costed out in a couple of other states. But we know that if we can do it for this, this cost in California, and Maryland is so much smaller than California, then why can't we do it here? Especially if CRISP already collecting data like this and submitting it to various parties, including the department, already doing this job, if they say that they can take it on, uh, we really believe that it's time to let's move ahead with this. We did meet with uh, the CEO of CRISP just this morning again, 
and with members from the health department. And we are confident that over the next 48 hours, we hope we can come up with some further amendments that may ameliorate their concerns. We hope you will pass the bill with that amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you for sharing your story. Senator Beidel has a question. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Larry, for sharing your story. I have a number of family members with Parkinson's. It's it's really amazing to me suddenly how many people that I meet and talk to that are being treated for Parkinson's. But correct me if I'm wrong, there's only a few medications that are used for Parkinson's. Doesn't it seem like CRISP could filter out the, the people that are taking that medication? Isn't that something they'd have in their records? We're not really going for the medicate who takes what medication um, at this point. We're looking for the diagnostic codes of who has been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Okay. Um, but you are correct when you say that there we're still aggressively looking in the pipeline. And I believe that there are a good two dozen in the pipeline from various um, biopharmaceutical companies that are trying to get to the FDA for okay. approval. But you know how hard that process is. Well, I just, you know, it's been that my family members all seem to take the same medication. So I just thought maybe yep. there was a way to filter that down, but thank you for the bill. And thank You're you, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any additional questions from the committee. So thank you all very much for your testimony. Have a good afternoon. That will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 584. <laughs> Colleagues will now turn to Senate Bill 871. Uh, Senator Washington, social workers, licensure, examinations, moratorium, and work group. Good afternoon, and please bring your panel forward if you have one. Yes, please, panel, come forward. You know who you are, Felicia, Dr. Michael, Dr. Wendy, Dr. Ellen, Lisa Klingemeyer, and Tara Harris. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee. Um, it's an honor to be here today and to have this opportunity to present to you SB 871, uh, Social Workers Licensure Moratorium and Work Group. I am, uh, well, I was going to say I was mindful of the day, of the hour, but it is, <laughs> I get moved up, but still I'm mindful of the hour. Uh, but I just do need to just say a few things just to let you know how I enter into this work. Uh, my best friend is a LCSWR. That's the highest uh, level of a social worker uh, in, in, in the state of New York. And she works in New York City. Uh, we've known each other since uh, my sophomore year in college. Uh, so I know how seriously social work practitioners take their responsibilities for the safety and the health of their clients and their families. I've seen firsthand the level of study, uh, the training, the skill acquisition, and the dedication it takes to get into and to stay into this profession. Her first job out of college as a BSW bachelor was working the overnight shift for New York City's foster care placement. Just imagine that at 2 a.m., taking a child into protective custody and worse, very often not really having a place to take them. For a break, she became a probation officer. Uh, yeah, you get the gist. Uh, uh, and then wanted to go back into her profession. She even uh, did some IT work, but she was just still very much called back. So just two years after she completed her terminal licensing, uh, she provided psychotherapy to survivors of the bombing of the Twin Towers. So I know and understand very deeply and respect very deeply the work. However, like with all things and all professions and all time, there sometimes there are times for change. And colleagues, I just want to frame the issue. I'll raise some things and then I want to frame it for you. Your job today is not to determine whether or not this test is racist, although you will hear testimony to that effect. Your job today is not to point fingers or to assign blame or to determine why the stark 
disparities in the administration of the Maryland Board of Social Work Examiners exam through their vendor ASWB exists. You're not to determine whether it's the fault of the student, the teacher, the academic institution, the insurance companies, or the makers of the exam. But you will hear testimony coming that may drive you to seek to explain in this moment those heinous disparities. But Madam Chair and committee members, today our job is about the health occupations, about its regulation as a profession, and determining what in the state of Maryland are the necessary prerequisites for practicing social work. And more importantly, and additionally, understanding and figuring out what are the methods for determining that. So this is not an indictment of the social work profession, although I will say some things that are quite indicting. I'm sure, uh, and that again is not to say that the makers of, the, of this exam are racist, although we have to admit that there is cultural bias. It is imperative that we ground ourselves in the history and contend to some of the problematic origins, not just of social work, but all of our health professions have a very similar history. So I'm not picking on social work, which is what some would say, but frankly, social work has the, had the courage as a profession to re re reveal findings of its national examination. But we can't just give you credit just, just because you revealed it without um, realizing or recognizing it. So social work is not exempt from our country's oppressive history. Social workers supported segregation in settlement houses, blocked African-Americans from gaining the right to vote, supported eugenics theories, recruited black men into the infamous Tuskegee experiment, participated in, in placing Native American children in boarding schools, and took part in the intake teams at the Japanese internment camps. Mm -hmm. These are to name a few. And lest we forget the Moynihan Report, which condemned the Black family and framed poverty as an individual, not a systemic problem. Though a social worker did not write it, the Moynihan Report negatively influenced perception of social work programs and the practice of social work. So one of the things, again, that excites me about social work is that its history is not grounded or limited by these repressive practices. The, the discipline and the beginnings of social work were very much grounded in the people, uh, grounded in doing the work, grounded in something, because I, again, I, I'm a professor, and so I tell my students this, this very difficult story of the social history of social work. But then I also tell them that there is this thing called social change and that that is what we are here to allow and to do. And social workers have been at the forefront of social change as well. They made us realize that we should, the child labor laws that we have today has to do with the very detailed notes that they took in visiting families. Right, The fact that we have civil rights acts and we understand the, uh, the damage that, that racism can do to individuals. And so many, and the, the, they don't get credit, but the social workers testified in civil rights cases and they gave all the credit to the lawyers. But I know that it was, the again, the stories of the social workers that really brought this forward. So that brings us to today. And just to give you an example, and you'll hear some of this, um, just imagine that you're a social work student and you just graduated and you, e you eagerly e take your exam and you fail. You have to wait three months to retake the exam. I'm not, however, given any record of what I got wrong uh, in the exam. Uh, I retest and finally passed after another failure. And then I have to wait six to nine months to receive my license from the board. I've now been out of work and out of the field for a year and a half. And yet now I'm considered, because I have passed the exam, the most qualified social worker. You have other student people that have worked in the field that do the 3000 hours, just like this other student, um, uh, that, that take the exam, pass, uh, uh, fail the exam, 
And somehow, because of an objective test about what is right and wrong when it comes to handling a family, I'm going to share with you some of the questions that uh, people are asked, and um, they, they are subjective to say the least. So just imagine then that I, yeah, that, that now that I've, I've taken this exam um, and now I can't pass and now I'm not able to, to do the work that I desire to do. So the problem with the exam and bringing you back to being, um, looking at this as a workforce issue, working, looking at this as also as a, um, um, an occupational management issue is that because of the test, if the rates, if the racial disparities did not exist today, we would have 1,227 more licensed social workers in Maryland today. Consider the impact on our state. That means, and we also know that the Kaiser Family Foundation has said that 81% of people in Maryland who need support, mental health support, are not getting it. This bill, Oh, as I said, social work is about social change. Some see the profession as moving beyond uh, just caring for people. You're going to read some testimony that actually eschews that history and, and has a fear that, um, that what we're doing here today is delegitimizing the practice. It is, it is lessening the status of the profession. And that is not it at all. It's quite, quite the contrary. Uh, you, you will see that there are those who are concerned that will not be able to uh, uh, bill their hours or somehow that the insurance companies uh, will say that they're not able to bill. And we will find that that's not true. So because of the egregious problems in the test, uh, this bill places a moratorium on using the exam as a requirement for one year. You give us a one year to explore, to work with uh, the test takers, to look at how long it takes in between the tests, to look at maybe if you got uh, some feedback on what you got wrong, that maybe that, that could increase. I'm not trying to whitewash and say that I do not fundamentally believe that there are cultural and racist um, biases in the exam, but as legislators, there are actual, just very pragmatic, uh, administrative um, and uh, adjustments and things that we can do while we are looking to find the right measure to, me to measure someone's capability. Um, additionally, what the bill does is form uh, a work group. Uh, the amendments that you have uh, see that we've added quite a number of people. Uh, the maker of the exam, the ASWB, I'm happy to say, has agreed to be a part of it. Uh, many of the people that have offered you testimony have agreed to be a part of it because this truly is all sides of this discipline. And this is truly a problem for all social workers to handle together as I've seen them do in the past. Um, so... Madam Chair, colleagues, I appreciate the opportunity for letting me talk a little bit. I have lots more to say. I'll, instead, I'll send it in um, uh, to, as my testimony where I refute concerns about the interstate compact, where I refute concerns about insurance, where I refute concerns about um, uh, the, the exam being the only measure. And then, then I just ask you to consider that isn't it quite possible that it is not in the interests of the state of Maryland or the families and children and workers of Maryland, that 3000 hours of, of work under the supervision of a licensed uh, social worker, that taking classes and performing well at the bachelor's level and at the master's level, and then in fact, having the opportunity to, to continue and to do this work, that a single exam can put a veto on someone's ability to get a license in Maryland. Thank you. So we hear, you'd hear from my, my committee. Um, and don't worry, everyone here isn't planning on testifying. All the folks in red are, are here. They are, they are teachers, they are educators, they are practitioners, 
and they're here to show their support. Uh, students, I, students, of course, <laughs> um, are here to show their support for making this change at this time uh, together. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Teron Harris. I'm a social worker. I've been practicing social work for the last 23 years. I received my bachelor's degree of social work from Virginia State University, and I uh, went on to receive my master's degree in social work from the University of Maryland in 2005. Um, shortly after graduating uh, with my master's, I began studying and preparing for my license exam on my own with um, different groups of friends and also um, colleagues and former classmates. Um, dur during that time of preparing for the exam, uh, one of the things that stood out to me was that uh, my peers and my colleagues mentioned that in order for me to pass the exam that I should probably answer the questions as if I was white in order for me to pass the exam. So that was something that you know st stood out to me. Um, I took the exam, unfortunately, I did not pass it. I think I got a 74 and the passage score was like a 75. So um, I came back um, three months later, um, took it again and unfortunately didn't pass it again. So I, at that point I started um, signing up for, um, to be able to take classes and, and to be able to prepare myself a little bit better. Um, unfortunately, I didn't pass it again. So what I did was I worked as a social worker under a clinical supervisor. So all of my notes and all my things had to be signed off by a clinical supervisor. Um, after trying to take it one more time in 2010 and not passing it, I decided to walk away from the clinical um, part of social work because it was just becoming a little bit too much. Um, and I started to develop imposter syndrome and having anxiety ab about the exam. Um, and I started doing um, MAKO, MAKO practice and, and working working with communities and, and, and different things like that. And, what, and, and the impact that I feel the exam has had on me is it, it has um, changed the trajectory of my career. So instead of being clinical, I was forced to do something else as a result of the exam. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Felicia Ross, and I am a licensed master's level social worker living and working in PG County. I and my parents, who are both decorated officers of the U.S. Navy and Army, respectfully, prepared me for hardships they faced throughout their service and lived experience. My father would often remind me that what people see sometimes outweighs what people are willing to hear, and so my job is to impact those who will listen. So I hope I am heard today. In 2019, I graduated with my MSW from Simmons University. I specifically chose a clinical track. Before graduating, I completed 1,000 plus hours of supervised internship practice. All hours were supervised by a licensed clinical level social worker. I never understood why my CSWE approved higher education and substantial supervised practice was not enough to enter the workforce. The job I had after graduation could not keep me because I failed the exam by three points. Three points stood between me and entering the field as a quote unquote official social worker. During test prep, I often heard you have to think like they want you to instead of here's what's practical. In August 2022, I had facts about what I had often felt. The exam is culturally biased and is a barrier to practice. ASWB testing practices do not protect the public. My education taught me how to protect the public. My supervised hours under a licensed clinical social worker taught me how to protect the public. This exam taught me how to not be myself nor respond to the public in culturally competent ways. Whenever, when I eventually passed, I found my passion as a therapist. Neither employers nor the insurance companies asked if I passed an exam. They asked if I was licensed. Could I qualify for an MPI and a CAQH? No applications asked if I took an exam just for my license number. I'm gearing up to take the exam again from to be a fully licensed social worker as an LCSW-C. SB 871 with a diversified work group would allow me and others like me to not focus on a culturally biased exam that we know we're probably not going to pass the first time. Instead, the focus could turn to a growing public and mental health crisis and finding an equitable path to licensure. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Lisa Klingemeyer. I'm the Assistant Director of Advocacy at Catholic Charities of Baltimore. I also have my MSW and I'm an adjunct faculty member at the School of Social Work. Catholic Charities is one of the largest providers of human services in Maryland, and we employ hundreds of social workers. We have social workers who work with older adults. We have social workers working with folks with um, intellectual disabilities, social workers in our homeless shelters, social workers in our schools, social workers in our mental health clinic. And we want a robust, a skilled, and diverse First workforce, a workforce who share the same identities and struggles as the individuals and families who are seeking services at our agency. But unfortunately, we've been facing a staffing shortage for a very long time, um, and we're not able to hire the diverse social work workforce that we would like to. For instance, we run the Esperanza Center in Baltimore City. This is a clinic primarily for our immigrant neighbors, and we have long struggled to hire social workers who are bilingual. And I don't know if you and your staff have ever used a language line before, but it is not a therapeutic practice to do therapy through a language line. And when we look at the exam, the failure rates for folks who English is not their first language is significantly higher than folks who are. And I know many of my colleagues will dive into some of the data more, but this exam looks like it stands as a real barrier for employers who want to be able to hire a diverse workforce. Our communities and our states are made better when we can hire social workers who understand the struggles of folks who are seeking services, who reflect the populations that we serve. We think the state should take the time it needs to examine the, the test and see if there are biases and what we can do about them so we can create an assessment that's not perpetuating inequality, marginalization, and discrimination. So for all those reasons, we strongly urge a favorable report on SB 871. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Senate Committee. My name is Wendy Shia. I am the Executive Director of the Center for Restorative Change at the University of Maryland. We're a community-facing program employing more than 60 staff members, many of whom are social workers. I testify today in support of SB 871. I want to tell you about a staff member of mine, Daniel, a Black man who holds an MSW degree from an accredited institution and is placed in a community setting. His supervisors, both in the community and at the School of Social Work, have praised his social work skills. He's known to be thoughtful, engaging, and competent. Daniel has taken the LMSW exam several times and has not passed it. As a result, Daniel's career is in jeopardy. Daniel's story is not uncommon. I've seen many people like Daniel, accomplished social workers who have obtained a master of social work degree, which included two years of study, field work, and close supervision. As the data have now shown, it is not uncommon for very competent people of color to fail the licensing exam multiple times. In many cases, the organization, the community, and the individual all lose when a skilled professional must be removed from or denied positions for reasons unrelated to their work performance. In contrast, I've had to terminate more licensed social workers of all races for poor performance and lack of competence than I care to count. Often these social workers pose a risk to their clients, partners, and the organization. Clearly, passing an exam alone does not protect our most vulnerable community members. It is skills, understanding of deep issues, and the ability to exercise ethical and consistent practice that does. I encourage the committee to pass SB 871. Thank you. Hello, Madam Chairperson and the committee. Thank you so much for letting me talk. Uh, my name is Dr. Ellen Schaefer Salins, and I am a social work professor from Salisbury University. I'm also a mental health therapist who's worked in Maryland and the DC area for about 40 years, providing mental health therapy to deaf and hard of hearing individuals. Um, in the past, I worked at agencies serving deaf and hard of hearing clients, and I was an adjunct professor at Gallaudet University, which is a, the only four year university for deaf and hard of, people, hard of hearing people in the world, which happens to be right here uh, in Washington, DC. Um, I wanted to testify about the ASWB social work licensing exam due to my years of work in the deaf community, working with skilled deaf and hard of hearing professionals with social work degrees. Many of these professionals have had difficulty passing the social work licensing exam and would take the exam five to 10 times before passing or many would not take the exam at all due to the fear they heard about other people taking the exam, or they would give up after many failed attempts. For many years, I was a consultant at an agency working with clients who were deaf and chronically mentally ill, signing off on paperwork because I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and many of the employees at that agency with the proper education and everything 
could not pass the exam and were not licensed, so they could not sign off on the work that they did. After years of seeing this pain and discrimination toward my colleagues, I worked with a professor at Gallaudet University, uh, Dr. Judy Mounty, when I was an adjunct professor there, to set up a course to teach deaf and hard of hearing people how to pass the social work licensure exam. I also tutored several deaf individuals through the years on how to pass the exam. The Gallaudet University course and my tutoring focused some on the content of the test, looking at social work practice and ethics, but the bulk of the class was teaching people how to understand the questions and how to pick the correct answers. We focused on learning social work vocabulary and how to decipher the questions and understand the nuances of English. I was teaching more about English than social work skills. Thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon, uh, I'm Dr. Mike Massey, a professor of social work at Catholic University in Maryland resident. Over the last two years, I've been doing extensive research and examination of the topic of social work license exams. And I'm gonna talk about why this bill is heavily supported by the evidence. What you hear from people who defend these exams is that they quote, protect the public. But the evidence says the opposite. First, the data overwhelmingly show that the licensure exams are a machine of inequality and racial stratification. Year after year, well-prepared, qualified, and competent, black and brown, older, and other social workers are delayed in their profession or cut out altogether based only on these exams. Over the 10-year period of exam outcome data we have, well over 1,200 social workers of color have been impacted in Maryland alone. Even more devastating is that as prior testimony has demonstrated, Maryland communities that need good social workers and would benefit from folks that share their identities and experiences are being denied service and support. That is not protecting the public. Now, if you know that these exams have such enormous negative impacts on so many people, there better be overwhelming and indisputable evidence that the exam outcomes have a relationship with safe, competent practice. But shockingly, in over 40 years of using these exams for licensure, there is no evidence, none, zero, that the exams measure social work competence or are connected to quality of practice at all. In fact, there's much more research evidence that calls into question the validity of the exams. The actual evidence says that these exams do not protect the public. They only deny Maryland a diverse pool of ready, willing, and able social workers. The bill serves the public and Maryland in numerous important ways. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I don't see any questions for the sponsor of this panel. So thank you for waiting late to get before the committee and enjoy your weekend. Thank you. All right. Colleagues, we're going to turn to the next panel on this bill. Uh, we'll start with Frank Boston, Ari Plout, Stacy Ben, Jacob Leffler, Victoria Rodriguez, Palavalu Bakalahi, No. Nope. And is Therese Hessler? <clears throat> good afternoon. You can proceed. Yes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Frank Boston III. I am here today on behalf of Presley Ridge. Uh, which is a social worker provider for foster care services for family and children in need. Uh, I've been before the committee on this issue about a month ago, but we are here today in support of this bill. We thank Senator Mary Washington uh, for, for sponsoring this uh, legislation. We support the work group. Uh, there, uh, there are basically three things I want to say. Uh, there's definitely... Uh, there, there are definitely disparities in the test scores. So number one, number two, there have definitely been 
occasions where the test is unavailable. And then number three, there's definitely a shortage of caseworkers. We support the legislation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Ari Plout, and I'm also here on behalf of Presley Ridge in support of uh, Senate Bill 871. Uh, unfortunately, some of our clients were not able to attend today, but I believe they submitted written testimony. Um, we support improving methods that would allow for more social workers, um, and you will also hear later today a temporary, uh, social, a temporary license for social workers. Um, we thank Senator Washington uh, for wanting to study alternative qualifications for social workers. We believe this is an interesting idea. We support the idea and the goals of what the work group will study. Uh, we believe the work group will develop recommendations that will help with the shortage in, of social workers. And we believe that there are existing qualified candidates that are able to practice social work that just haven't been able to. Um, and we, we would like to be part of the work group and we support Senate Bill 871. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Teresa Hessler, and I'm here today representing the Maryland Association of Resources for Families and Youth, also known as Marthy. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. The members of Marfi represent providers who serve Marylanders most vulnerable children who are in out of home placements due to abuse, neglect, or severe mental health and medical needs. Our members are social workers, operate group homes, treatment foster care programs, and independent living programs, primarily serving the foster care population, as well as the juvenile services program. We are here today asking for your support on Senate Bill 871. This thoughtful legislation would establish a work group to address systemic inequities and disparities with passage and failure rates and differences in the test taking pertaining to social work exam licensing. This bill aims to explore how we can increase workforce recruitment and evaluate how we can be more effective in evaluating the qualifications of social work candidates. This approach shows a commitment to improving the licensing process without compromising the quality of social work services providing to Maryland residents. It is for these reasons we ask for a favorable report. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jacob Leffler. I am the secretary of the Maryland Association for the Deaf. We at MDA do support the um, bill 871. I want to thank Senator Washington for this bill. Uh, there's many deaf and hard of hearing and deaf blind people who uh, graduate with social work degrees from Galileo universities or other universities who struggle to get licensure because of the test itself. Um, there are many deaf and deaf blind hard of hearing people who take the exam and struggle because of the uh, linguistic structure of the test itself and the cultural biases that are related to this test. Um, because of the hearing, uh, that for those who um, who take as hearing uh, have can take this test and they can make uh, guesses, and while deaf people cannot, um, and they have no, they don't have auditory skills, and it's harder for us to uh, respond to those questions correctly, and they struggle to um, serve in our community. The other issue um, is our community are there are many deaf and deaf blind and hard of hearing people um, or licensed. They could, there's not a lot of licensed. Uh, social workers that can take care of directly of deaf, other deaf and hard of hearing, uh, deaf blind, and they don't have uh, the client hours to meet with them. Uh, there are many deaf people that have to work with hearing interpreters, or hear, hearing clinic workers uh, with through interpreters, and they have they don't cannot address the issues that are in the deaf community itself. So we in the deaf community prefer to have direct communication and someone that would understand their life experiences through. Uh, being growing up as a deaf person. If this bill is passed, it, it would address some of those issues that exist and would create more opportunities for deaf and hard of hearing and deaf uh, blind and uh, in the state of Maryland and get licensure and look for other ways for get licensing. And I would like to ask for uh, support of this bill. Hi, uh, my name is Victoria, um, and I am a long-term social worker. I um, have a background in 
preventive case management, therapeutic foster care, leadership management, um, and mental health. I am currently a therapist. I have uh, my LCSW in New York. I have my LMSW in Maryland. I'm in the process of getting my see-through endorsement. I am just going to read off a few key points. So when the exams exclude dedicated, compassionate, and talented social workers from moving in their career, the quality of life for both the social workers and the residents in Maryland are significantly impacted in the following ways. Increase of Maryland residents with unaddressed mental health and substance abuse disorders, a decrease of accessible preventive measures and mental health emergency services in low income communities. There's an increase in 911 calls. There's overcrowded ER rooms due to an uptick of behavioral health visits for mental health crisis, substance abuse, and or psychotropic medication refills. There are extensive wait lists for Maryland residents to gain access to community mental health services. There are increased of burnout and turnover amongst existing licensed social workers due to understaffing, which leads to unsustainable work environments. There's disruptive service delivery gaps in mental health services for Maryland residents due to overburdened caseloads, understaffed agencies, and overworked existing licensed social workers. Unlicensed and LMSWs often work multiple demanding jobs in order to keep, keep up with the cost of living while managing intensive caseloads and paperwork requirements while trying to study for the exam, which is not feasible, conducive, or healthy. The lack of diverse representation in the field often prevents marginalized community members from seeking out mental health services or sustaining mental health services due to existing healthcare disparities. Did we hear from the whole panel? Yes. Excellent. Yes. I don't see any questions for you from the committee. So thank you very much for your testimony, for participating in the hearing. I'll call forward the next panel, Adam Schneider, who signed up in favor of the bill, Dion Bushrod, Brittany Barber Alexander, Kyle Berkeley, and Carla Abney, who signed up favorable with amendments. Good afternoon. You can get started as soon as you get settled. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Adam Schneider. Um, I've worked and taught social workers in, uh, worked with and taught social workers in Maryland for over 20 years, and I'm here in su strong support of Senate Bill 871. You have my written testimony and you've heard from others, so I won't repeat those things. Uh, instead, I want to take just a moment to uh, point out some places that I might agree with some of the opponents. Um, there is controversy here, but the controversy should be that our current licensing practice and exam say that white people are more competent social workers than black people. Our current exam says that young people are more competent, safer, more accountable social workers than older people. That native English speakers are more competent, are, are safer to work with than non-native English speakers. And that people who lack disabilities are more competent than those who are disabled by our society. That should be the controversy that we're focused on. We should be focused on ending this discriminatory practice and exam. Uh, and this is about the integrity of social work in Maryland. The existence, the maintenance of clearly biased and discriminatory practices, like we see in this exam, is a stain on the integrity of this vocation. Too many social work leaders have taken too little action Although the data was released only recently, everybody knew that these disparities existed. In faculty meetings, we talked about the need to support certain students more than others because the exam was not fair. We need your help. I'm asking you to help us to suspend the exam and help us have a process that can move forward so that we can have a, uh, a, 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 a practice that it has integrity and without this controversy. Thank you.
Madam Chair, would you, would you let the doctor speak uh, her name? I, I got the wrong name. So she was a part of my original panel. So that's what you, oh, oh, say. Yes, uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Dr. Anna McFadder. Uh, I am the Dean of the School of Social Work at Morgan State University. Uh, and when you called the name of Stacy Ben, that was the admin who submitted my paperwork. And so I, I thank you for the opportunity uh, uh, to speak. And I'm happy to uh, speak on behalf of both practitioners and educators, uh, you know, in the social work field. I, I'll start with a, a brief story. Um, I have both a, uh, I have a bachelor's, a master's and a PhD in social work. I was a seasoned social worker before I entered uh, social work education. I had several years of teaching experience as well. I took the exam for the first time as a faculty member when I relocated to Maryland at the University of Maryland at the time, the only master's degree program in the state of Maryland. Um, and it was, it was uh, quite interesting. I was teaching graduate students in social work. I took the exam and barely passed it the first time by two points. I found the exam confusing irrelevant to the experiences, the numerous experience that I had had in social work um, and, 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 and did not have any content that represented the diverse demographics of the state uh, at that time. So it was irrelevant to the experiences that I had had as a social worker and an educator teaching a, a diverse uh, population. Two things happened that I think are worth mentioning. When, so when licensure began in this state, a number of social workers were grandparented into licenses. At a subsequent time, a number of uh, clinical social workers were grandparented uh, into licensure. So we have currently practicing social workers and people who are heading programs in this state who have never taken the licensing exam, but they are the ones who are running social work programs. And I think that's important uh, uh, to mention as, as well. Uh, my point is um, you know, that this bill is essential. At this point, it reminds us of relics of our past history that must be addressed uh, I think the previous speakers have always already demonstrated the severe need that we have for social workers. I don't know if you know that 75% of social workers are mental health clinicians. Uh, if you know that the suicide rate for our young people is escalating uh, and everybody is looking for social workers, we must find ways to assess competence kind of uh, in this area. And I am wrapping it up. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Kyle Berkeley. I'm a licensed master's level social worker. I hope my words please the General Assembly. I have worked in this field of social work since 2009, actually since 2004, if you count my years in corrections. During my career, I've only worked with three African-American males with LCSWC status. One of those males is currently the president or CEO of the NASW. Sadly, the exam costs $260 and has become a gatekeeper for people like me to advance in this field. Again, my name is Dr. Kyle Berkeley. I have a PhD. Um, before, before the ASWB released the data providing the disproportionate pass-fail ratio among African-Americans with the exam, I wrote the previous executive director for the Maryland Board of Social Work examiners, Dr. Weinstein and I have the email chain, and he dismissed and also blamed schools like Morgan and Coppin uh, for the disproportionate pass-fail ratio. Um, in my field of expertise, I work with the homeless, people in crisis, I actually work for Ronda County Crisis um, in the evenings. When I leave here, I'm going there. Um, I work with psychotic clients, yet with my training and expertise, I can only amass entry-level pay due to my licensure. I'm working three jobs because I can only earn entry level pay and I still have to pay that 260 every time I take the exam. And I've taken an exam more than 10 times. To further my point and paint a picture, I'm a married father of three. My youngest daughter has special needs. I have paid thousands of dollars in trainings such as LEAP, Fill in the Gaps, ACBAR, Therapist Development Center, and Social Work Solutions, only to watch my white colleagues that have taken the same exact trainings pass on the first time I call them unicorns because you never can find one I could fail on the first time. Um, and they can move up in the field while I'm still making entry-level pay 
and trying to buy Peter to pay Paul to amass my daughter's bills. Um, I've missed out on several opportunities of promotion and advancement in this field since 2019. I've experienced emotional and spiritual breakdowns due to this exam. Thank you for your time. Is it coming in closer? Oh, there we go. Thank you. You turn it down. I'm going to break it. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee members. I am Dion Brown Bushrod, a certified social worker licensed at the clinical level. I am here on behalf of the Maryland chapter of the National Association of Social Workers, a statewide membership organization. We support forming a work group. We do not support a moratorium on licensing examinations at any licensure level. The current testing data shows disparate outcomes for marginalized groups. The data is alarming. Yes. Are the results surprising? No. As social workers, and you are correct, Senator Washington, we are fully aware of the effects of oppressive systems and how these systems operate as conscious and unconscious gatekeepers. To open the gates, please consider how the state can legislatively require all testing vendors to demonstrate and document fair practices for Maryland health occupation licensing exams. Certainly, the state should create corrective and restorative plans to ensure equitable and accessible testing, hence the need for a work group. Let us take time to create viable solutions before changing social work laws and those laws that could change and have long-term effects. Please review our written testimony for an important list of key voices to include in the work group. And ignoring these voices and instituting a moratorium may create unintended consequences that will damage the profession and create more harm for those the bill intended to help. In summary, we ask for your support to pass Senate Bill 871 with an amendment to eliminate the moratorium on licensing examinations and to change the work group composition. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Brittany Barbara Alexander. I'm also a licensed clinical social worker and a member of the NASW Maryland chapter and legislative committee. We also still oppose the moratorium on license. This bill, I think, is a little bit misguided politically. Um, yes, we do agree with what everything everyone else said about this exam so far. Um, I'm one of the statistics myself. I happen to actually pass at the very end. However, I think this is a hasty decision. A right to sit for the exam shouldn't be eliminated. Instead, we should be making changes to the exam. Um, placing a moratorium on a required license does actually uh, devalue our profession. We need to change the exam. So the ASWB needs to be held accountable and make the necessary changes to this test in a thoughtful way that actually addresses the test biases. This is why we do support a working group that we can actively participate in and organize and help with the hopes that we can come up with a more strategic plan moving forward um, that would directly address the real issues to this exam. In closing, we are asking for a favorable report for SB 871 with amendments that strikes the moratorium but modifies the composition of the work groups. And if nobody else said it, happy social work month. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Carla J. Abney. I'm a licensed master social worker in Maryland, as well as a registered nurse. I'm a therapist and the president of the Greater Washington Society of Clinical Social Work. I have a master's in nursing and in social work from Catholic University, and I'm currently pursuing my PhD in social work at Catholic University. I want to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify in support with amendments on Senate Bill 871. A mental health crisis is gripping Maryland as well as the nation. Unfortunately, there are not enough therapists to help those in need. Senate Bill 871 proposes to eliminate social work licensing exams in order to deal with this crisis. While a quick fix, I ask that you consider the long-term consequences of this bill to ensure solutions will be nationally recognized. Social workers are more than just CPS employees. We're the largest provider of mental health treatment in our country. We diagnose and provide psychotherapy to individuals with mental health disorders or substance use conditions. The proposed elimination of the licensed exams could jeopardize insurance reimbursement, provisions and clinical services, as well as a Maryland social worker's ability to receive licensure by endorsement in another state. I ask that any solutions don't risk Maryland's participation in the interstate social work compact, similar to Maryland's participation in the interstate nursing compact. 
The compact will increase the number of social workers who practice in Maryland, as well as Maryland licensed social workers' ability to practice in other states. Today, I sit before you as an anomaly. I'm a black woman over the age of 50, a member of two groups identified as having low passage rates of the ASW, ASWB exam. As has long been suspected, and the, as long as been suspected, excuse me, um, the negative impacts of the exam were finally confirmed. I asked that the, the work group include from a member from the School of Social Work, a member from a local social work association, and at least one graduate like myself with no risk to survivorship bias. For all the solutions people are proposing, no one has tried to answer the question, why aren't people passing the exam? I would urge the committee to allow the work group to conduct its study prior to the elimination of the exam. With my amendment noted, I would like to thank the committee for allowing me to present my testimony today. Thank you very much. And thank you for sharing your experiences with the committee and your testimony. Senator Lamb has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to the committee or to the panel rather. Um, this question is for, I guess, the representatives from NASW, the Maryland chapter. And, um, you know, was looking at the bill and was trying to figure out if there's some way to be able to find some middle ground here. Um, and, and I think in the past, there were some social workers that were able to obtain the license without having to um, go through an exam. I'm curious if you're open to kind of a, a middle pathway where the non-clinical social workers would not have to take an exam um, as in, in, in the moratorium, in place of the moratorium for now, right? So, so the moratorium would be just for non-clinical social workers to not take the exam while the work group meets and tries to figure some of this out. You want to speak first? Yeah. Well, if I'm asking for my thoughts on that, my thoughts is that if anybody who wants to take the exam, they should be allowed to. There are people who already paid their funds, have test dates already, some graduating seniors right now. I don't think that should be eliminated. I think they should be able to take it. And as far as the other thing that you said, that could be an option. I think we're all open to that. I think we should have options. You should have the choice. It is a choice to choose this career path. Every degree, every um, other type of profession has a license that you have to take. So we should not just dismantle it. We need to make the changes to make it fair and equitable. It makes no sense not to have one. LCPCs have one. Psychiatrists have one. Nurses have one. We just need to make ours more fair. I, I get that. My, my question is, <laughs> would you be open to uh, a moratorium applying to non-clinical social workers, like bachelor's level social workers, um, only for now? while the work group meets and, and keeping the licensing exam for, or keeping the exam for- um, The master's and clinical level. What do you think on that? I don't think so. It's complicated. It it's complicated. I would love for a work group to bat that around. My initial response, and I'm just speaking for me now, my because we need to take it back to NESW. But my initial response is, mm -hmm. if you give a license to non-clinical licensees, what is the measure of competency? Right now in our law, the measure of competency is the exam. So how are we determining when someone is ready to then go on for training and then go on to sit for the clinical exam. So if we let people in, so let's say the, the clinical exam is for people who want to do clinical work. And in our law, clinical is defined by formulating a diagnosis, rendering a diagnosis, assessment, treatment, behavioral health disorders. So when we have someone who is saying, I'm ready to get on that track, and they've come into the field without an exam, what, what is the level of, of competency for that clinician, for that future clinician? I don't have the answers. I don't know. I would love for a work group to be able to process that. I, I think what, we're, what we get into is wanting to have a quick fix. And our field is very complicated. It's very complicated in the state. It's very complicated across the nation. So let's be thoughtful before we throw out ideas that can have long-term effects. Uh, May I respond? Uh, yes, I'd like to respond to that because one of the recommendations uh, that have come from the people that I talked to is that a temporary license be issued during this period of, of, of the moratorium. But I also like to add that 
almost all of the national social work organizations support this effort. The Council on Social Work Education, which accredits all social work programs, have written a letter indicating that when you receive a bachelor's and a master's degree from an accredited social work program, you are prepared to do social work. So if you you're say, interested in life, in be, becoming a clinical social worker, then further uh, requirements should be there. So you and so, when you say all these, the national national association the for the national association for deans and directors of social work, the council on social work education, uh, the national association of social work has supported a moratorium to study, um, you know, as well, as well as one of the clinical. Uh, associations for social work. So just to be clear, a moratorium on the, the moratorium the, the test on the, the testing while the work group looks at this this whole situation. Oh, the, the position of the bill. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. I mean to to the to the NSAW um, Maryland chapter. You know, I, I understand the concerns there. I think, though, there's a, a little bit of a different level of um, risk and, and competency to the folks who are not. <laughs> who are not in a clinical environment um, than those who are in a clinical environment. I think there's a different level of, of risk and competency there to it. But uh, with that, let me hand back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I uh, don't see any additional questions for this panel. Let me thank you all for your testimony, okay, for you. sharing your experiences. For those of you that don't know, I held an LCSWC and an LICSW. I want to thank the sponsor for bringing this bill we're going to hear some suggestions from some additional panelists, and I think everybody's clear there's some work to be done in this space. So thank you all very much. Thank you. We're going to call forward the next panel, Daphne McClellan, Stacey Owens, Terry Collins-Green, Bania Reed, Susanna Sung, Christine Crone. Let's see how many of those are here. And let's have Judith Gallant on deck. So I think there are some seats on the front row for you. All right, good afternoon. Good to see you, Daphne. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Dr. Daphne McClellan, Executive Director of the Board of Social Work Examiners and also a licensed social worker. I hope that you have read and will read our position paper because it has a lot more details. I would like to respond to two things that Senator Washington said. One is that once a person has passed the exam and the criminal background check, it takes us about a week to um, give them their license, not six to nine months. Um, I would also like to um, point out in her in her presentation, she talked about that is the responsibility of this committee for all healthcare occupations. And we would really like to ask you to demand that every healthcare occupation you have oversight of give the same kind of report on the exams that they use that ASWB has given on their exam. So we can see about disparities in all of our healthcare occupations. The board and I personally are very concerned about the report from ASWB about the disparities in pass rates on the ASWB exam. I have been paying close attention to the reports from our applicants, many of whom are here, who have had difficulty passing the exam. We support the idea of a work group, and we are glad to hear from Senator Washington the additions that she wants to make to that group, because the group that what is proposed in the legislation is not sufficient to meet her stated objectives. If this legislation does not pass, our board is committed to establishing a task force to address the issue of the disparity in pass rates on the ASWB exam. This task force would include representatives of all the academic social work programs in Maryland, three of which are HBCUs. We will also include representatives of governmental and non-governmental social service agencies and professional social work associations, including the Baltimore Legacy Chapter of ABSW. Stakeholders, including those who have been negatively impacted by the examination requirement and those who feel the requirement is necessary to their practice, will be included. Every effort will be made to make sure that this is a diverse and goal-oriented group. We hope that this commitment will meet the concerns of your committee, and thank you for the opportunity. Madam Chair and members of the committee, good afternoon. 
My name is Stacey Owens, and I've been a licensed social worker in Maryland for eight years, licensed for a total of 19 years, and for the past 13 years, I volunteered and consulted with ASWB. I'm testifying against SB 871 because I believe that putting a moratorium on the social work licensing exams will pose a risk to the public and that decreasing standards is especially problematic in a field that serves people who are vulnerable. This bill presumes that competence is established solely through the completion of an education program. This conclusion threatens public protection structure and diminishes regulatory accountability. Education programs, though accredited, are varied in their instructional approaches and student experiences. A licensing exam, on the other hand, is a uniform measure. It gets its validity through an analysis of the practice of social work and ensures that exam content reflects knowledge, skills, and abilities needed for safe, competent, and ethical practice. I know this firsthand, having been a part of ASWB's examination development, and I'm ha happy to answer questions about that. I also know about ASWB's plan for using an expanded practice analysis survey to bring more voices to the construction of the exams for the future. Last year, ASWB took the groundbreaking step of publishing pass rate data. While no one would dispute that the disparities are disturbing, this was an important first step in exploring causes of these gaps and reviewing system-wide disparities. ASWB has committed to working with the education community by supplying a suite of free exam resources to help social work educators prepare their students to demonstrate competence on the exams. ASWB is also working on re-envisioning the current competence assessment for social workers and is working across the profession to support this effort in a data-driven manner. These efforts are underway with a plan to be ready for release of alternative assessments in 2026. I urge you to consider the unintended consequences of eliminating the competence assessment requirement for licensure and to vote no on SB 871. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Klausmeyer, and members of the Senate Finance Committee. My name is Christine Crone, and I'm here testifying on behalf of the Maryland Clinical Social Work Coalition, sponsored by the Greater Washington Society for Clinical Social Work, which represents the interests of more than 9,300 licensed clinical social workers in Maryland. On behalf of the coalition, we oppose Senate Bill 871. I don't want to repeat many of the very good points that previous panelists have um, offered, I just would like to emphasize that the Council of State Governments partnered with the Department of Defense and the Association of Social Work Boards have developed a new interstate compact, and we anticipate legislation allowing Maryland to participate in that compact next session. We understand there are workforce issues in the field, and the compact is one approach aimed at reducing barriers to license portability. The coalition wants to have an equitable exam, but we also don't want to jeopardize Maryland's participation in the interstate compact. Changing the requirements for licensure in Maryland will do just that. For this reasons and the re reasons um, previous panelists have stated, we respectfully oppose Senate Bill 871. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Benia Reed, and I've been a licensed social worker in Maryland for 21 years, and I have volunteered and consulted with the ASWB for 15 years. I too am testifying against SB 871 because I also believe that putting a moratorium on the social work licensing exams will pose a huge risk to the public. Our licensure structure is what protects the public, and that includes education, the exam, and experience. Lowering these standards is especially problematic in a field that serves the most vulnerable populations. I am also in private practice and there are other mental health professions who are excluded and not allowed to be Medicaid or Medicare providers, for example, due to their lower licensing standards. I know from my experience that social work is indeed a profession. Efforts like SB 871 threaten a slippery slope toward deprofessionalization. They also run counter to our public protection mandate. In my work on ASWB exams, I've participated in the many steps that ASWB takes to ensure exam fairness. I've been a writer for the exam, a member of the exam committee that approves questions for the exams, and I'm currently an editor for current writers of the exam. Professional social workers are involved in every step of exam development and represent a diversity of race, ethnicity, gender, age, and practice area. I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have about how the exams work and how questions are developed. By the way, um, candidates do get feedback in areas when they fail, and schools also get feedback um, 
in areas of how their students are doing in different content areas. ASWB has already opened exam, the exam development process through efforts at the grassroots level by conducting community conversations with social workers and at the leadership level by convening leaders of social work organizations in what are called Social Work Workforce Coalition, which has met for the third time last week. I urge you to consider the consequences of deprofessionalizing social work and reject SB 871. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to testify. My name is Susanna Sung. I've been a licensed social worker in Maryland for 26 years and have volunteered with ASWB for 22 years. I'm testifying against SB 871 because I believe that placing a moratorium on the social work licensing exams will delegitimize our profession and pose a risk to the public that lowering standards is especially pro problematic in a field that serves the most vulnerable populations. Today, I bring my experience working in both examination development and the development of the social work compact for multi-state practice. Social workers deserve to have practice mobility and for the public needs, they need services from competent social workers. At a time when practice mobility across jurisdictional lines, including rapidly evolving service modalities like telehealth, an additional benefit of an objective uniform exam is portability. For the military and others, the exam offers opportunities beyond a single state's boundaries, which is especially important in our DMV area, and that's for every single level of the exam. Because a passing score in Maryland meets the same standard as a passing score in Washington state, jurisdictions using the exam are also supporting administrative endorsement efficiencies, better agility for social work service providers, and broader access for client populations. Also, as someone who has been working on that compact, I know for a fact that not having an exam would exclude Maryland State from participating in that compact. My experience with exam development has shown me the steps ASWB takes to ensure fairness in its exams, including the rigorous psychometric analysis of every single exam item to identify potential bias. I also know that ASWB is exploring options for additional ways of assessing competence to ensure that entry to practice is open to everyone who meets licensure requirements requirements that rightly include an objective and uniform demonstration of the ability to practice safely, competently, and ethically. I believe the exam disparities reflect the racism baked into all of our country's systems. Getting rid of the exam does not get rid of racism. It only endangers the public. I urge you to consider the consequences of Maryland's ability to participate in the social work compact and vote no on SB 871. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, committee members. My name is Terry Collins Green. I'm an LCSWC uh, for 16 years in Maryland. I am the, currently the director of social work division at the Maryland Office of the Public Defender. And I want to bring up first that the social work exam is not the only national exam that has racial disparities. In 2021, uh, Bloomberg Law published a report that there are stark racial disparities in the bar exam. Um, and that last year, uh, just 66% of black law school graduates passed the bar exam on their first try. I am concerned about passing uh, SB 871 because as a defense-based so forensic social workers, um, the Maryland Court of Appeals passed in 2020 the Daubert standard. That's a higher standard for our social workers who are testifying as clinical experts, and we have to meet a better, a higher standard. Passing SB 71 can jeopardize those types of social workers who have to testify and provide uh, information to the court specific to our clients who have mental illness and substance abuse. Last, I wanna make the point about social worker shortages. In 2016, there was a social work report card forecast that said that by 2030, the nation would experience a total shortfall of over 195,000 social workers. The social worker shortage is not going to be fixed by SB 871. Uh, social workers are one of the highest ranking uh, and growing industries across the country. Uh, again, I just urge that this bill does not strengthen the social work profession for the 18,000 licensed social workers in Maryland, nor does it protect uh, or make Maryland citizens safer. Well, this is interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you.
Thank you for allowing me to testify. I'm Judith Gallant, Chair of the Maryland Clinical Social Work Coalition. On behalf of the coalition, we oppose Senate Bill 871. I have also practiced in foster care agencies in New York, a family service center in Baltimore, and private practice in the DC area since 1980. Currently, the LCSWC is considered a healthcare provider in Maryland. We diagnose and provide psychotherapy to individuals suffering from mental health disorders and substance use conditions. However, since nationally, the licensure of all other health professional health providers depends on passing an exam. The bill's proposed elimination of licensing exams could jeopardize insurance reimbursement and provision of clinical services. Such jeopardy could come at a time when there is a mental health crisis in our country and our state, and mental health providers are in short supply. With clinical social workers being the largest provider of mental health treatment in our country, can Maryland afford to lose the treatment clinical social workers provide? And to those who have spoken about shortages and burnout in social work, this is true in nursing and physician professions, as well as in many other pro professions in our society currently. In addition, doing away with the testing will put at risk Maryland's participation in the Interstate Social Work Compact, recently re released by the State Council, Council of State Governments. The compact will broaden availability of social workers to practice in our state, and it will broaden opportunities for Maryland licensed social workers to practice in other states. The compact requires that a state's clinical social work licensure entails passing a nationally recognized exam in order for the state to become part of the compact. ASWB is partnering with a number of social work organizations, including the Clinical Social Work Association to examine and eliminate any racial bias issues there may be within the exams. This will take some time to complete. Passage of 871 could uh, result in unintended consequences that would be extremely damaging to our clients and our profession. Um, and also just a side note, the National Clinical Social Work Association does not support a moratorium um, on the exam. Thank you all very much for your testimony. Senator Guile has a question followed by Senator Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Christine, if I could have a question to you regarding the, um, we, just the, the compact. I, I, I like compacts, you know, for a lot of reasons, and especially that I think it helps military spouses and veterans moving from state to state. But, um, and uh, I, I, I know we're going to talk about this a bit with the, with the next bill, but let, let's say, you know, hypothetically, we decide we're not necessarily going to do a moratorium. We'll keep offering this exam. But in the meantime, we'll issue temporary licenses, you know, for a year or two years, whatever it may be while we, while we figure this out. Um, so people can take the exam or they can go the temporary licensure route. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts are if, if we went that route on whether or not the participation and whether or not Maryland could then participate in the, um, in the proposed uh, compact. Can I punt the question to Judy Gallant? Yeah, <laughs> sure, please, thank you. Oh, good, good, good. So I actually worked on the compact. Okay. Um, so I could tell you that we would not be eligible to participate. We need a national, um, uh, a national qualifying exam to be part of the compact. You, so even you, with, if we have a temporary moratorium, we are- No, not I'm not suggesting that we should have a moratorium yeah. nece uh, necessarily. I'm, su I'm suggesting, let's say, you know, as a solution to figuring out what we think is, I think, a, a real problem, yes. a, a real, real concern. But if we say, okay, we're not necessarily going to do a, a moratorium on the exam. If, if people want to take the exam, they could take the exam. But why don't we issue a temporary license for, for you know, for a year or two? People don't have to take the exam and practice for a year or two years or wh however we decide to set it. However, yeah. I guess it's determined by SB 872, which we're going to hear next. Do you think that's going to impact our- It absolutely will. It will disqualify us from being able to- be Because we allow certain social workers to practice without an exam? Yes. On a temporary licensure basis? Yes. Okay. That's within the law. That's, that's the legislation that's being yeah. written. Yes. I think that it would exclude those people who have the temporary license, meaning that they wouldn't. So it's not necessarily Maryland couldn't participate in the compact in as much as those that are licensed and given temporary licensure wouldn't be able to then practice social work if they moved to a different state that was part of the compact. Is that what you're suggesting? The is clear. Okay. No. So even, even though we would still be requiring a 
an exam in our statute the fact that, and we have all these other people who've passed an exam, they wouldn't be able to participate. But perhaps, perhaps, you know, perhaps you we think, need to find, we need think to think about it, it and get back to us. I understand <laughs> there's some disagreement about what the answer is. I know it's like a well, hypothetical she knows much there, more about it than but I just do. It, it, think about it and get back to us. You can also look at the, the law has been released okay. by the state council of state governments. Okay. Thank that you. will be there. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank, okay. thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Senator. So well, that'll be a continuing conversation. It's uh, we know that we're going to have some work to do. I'm going to go to Senator Lamb and then Vice Chair Klausmeyer. All right. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a, a just a, a point to point out here because I was looking at Comar and in Comar in regs, the board's own regs do permit out of state uh, social workers to temporarily practice social work without an exam. Right. And so, you know, I think that's already in current regs. Yes, but all of those people who are being licensed by endorsement are already licensed in other states, and we do not allow anyone to be um, endor licensed by endorsement who has not passed an exam. Okay. So, yes, I mean, they they people who apply for licensure by endorsement in Maryland are allowed to practice for six months while their licensure process is being completed, but it but is a requirement in our statute that they must have passed an exam. Did in order Illinois to be licensed move here. to remove the licensing requirement, the test requirement for licensing? Pardon me? Did Illinois move to remove the Illinois has removed the license, the test requirement at the BSW and MSW level, but not at the clinical level. So what's going to happen with Illinois folks that are coming in via the compact, obtaining a temporary license now per our regs? Mm -hmm. And have not had the exam. Why they so would why not be able to be licensed by endorsement in Maryland until they take the exam under our statute. Doesn't that not comply with the compact? The compact allows these folks to obtain a temporary license. Well, they won't be allowed to be in the compact either. But the the people from Illinois, if they haven't done the had an but exam, but the compact doesn't say these people can be and those people can't be. It says if you are licensed in this state, you can't be receiving reciprocity in another state. But not every state will be able to be a part of the compact. It depends on what their requirements are in their state. But isn't Illinois part of the compact now? No, there's no compact now. No compact. The compact okay. has just been um, released okay. within the past few weeks, and it is now going through the legislative process in, in several states. It will have to pass in seven states before it can even start to become a compact. So it's, a, oh, you know, there's right, a process. Right, right. So, okay. Um, I was looking at Maryland law and the law currently requires that the exam uh, be that be, the exam that's being used shall be free of cultural bias. I think that's actually stated in current statute. And so, you know, I guess my question to you as a representative of the board, uh, Dr. McClellan, is, you know, what, what specifically is the board doing to try to address the issues of bias here? Because, you know, everything I've heard up to this point is kind of along the lines of we're going to look at it, we're going to study this, but I haven't heard any concrete actions and specific steps are being taken by the board to try to address this concern, which I think all of us agree is very real. I think, so the report came out in August. We are, um, we are suggesting the same thing that Senator Washington is suggesting, that if for some reason this bill does not pass or the work group part of this bill does not pass, we would create a task force at the board to look at the disparities and, and start talking about what are some other alternatives or things that could be done um, in order to address this issue. We are concerned about the issue and we do want to address it. Okay. And it, as was stated in my testimony and in our written testimony as well. And I think it's important to note that the, the responsibility in statute to have a test that's free of cultural bias lies with the board. It's a board responsibility. And that, so, is, that is true, Senator. And um, it also says under statute that it has to be a national exam. And unfortunately, right now, the ASWB exam is the only national exam that's available. So we have to work with what there is until there's something else to work with. Right. Well, that's why we have this bill to remove the national exam. Right. Um, the last question here is to, um, I guess, the point that I was making earlier, which is, you know, I think there's a distinction, at least in, in my head, between um, non-clinical social work and, and clinical social work. And um, there are a lot of folks that um, still practice things that are akin to social work in a non-clinical environment, which 
has a much lower risk profile, probably has different competencies or level of competencies. And so, um, you know, is would the board be open to having folks that are in um, non-clinical practice of social work uh, have a moratorium for those folks specifically to be able to continue their practice while we look at, to be able to practice rather, while we look at this issue? I was sitting here um, while everyone was um, testifying today and thinking um, the profession of social work is a square peg trying to get into a round hole. We do not, we are not like the other healthcare occupations in the sense that we do not have a narrow focus of what our profession does. Social work is so broad that the social work profession has a hard time agreeing on what exactly it is. And um, I, I don't think anyone in the room would disagree with that. Um, we are we are in the health occupations part of the law, but there are so many social workers who, as you say, are not clinical and who have never practiced any kind of health occupation, who do a variety of um, very important and wonderful things. Um, so the problem is that because our statute is within the health occupations, we have to meet certain criteria. And it's and once a person is licensed as an LMSW, there's nothing saying that they can't be doing something non-clinical today when they get licensed and next week decide to start doing something clinical. And there's not, you know, there, there's nothing that would stop them from doing that. So we would really have to rewrite and reconsider all of our regulations if we were going to somehow say that there's a moratorium on exams for or, or temporary licenses for LMSWs who don't practice clinical social work and you know that and put them into some sort of separate category because there is no such separate category currently in our statute or our regs. And I guess I guess the point of me asking that is that it it just seems like um, a lot of these folks are going to be doing unlicensed practice of social work anyway. That if there was some way to bring them under the umbrella of the board, it would actually be maybe safer or more secure in some way because you'll actually be able to track some of these people who are essentially doing unlicensed practice of social work. So, you know, I think that that I understand your point, but I think there's also a point to be made about the balance there that you would actually have a better idea of who these folks were because they're engaging in unlicensed practice of social work currently. I think there's so much to be discussed. I mean, it, it's it's huge. It's a huge topic, and I I agree with you that it there's a lot to be thought about. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, did you say there was a report that came out last year? Yes, ma'am. Um, the the concerns that's being expressed through both of these pieces of legislation by Senator Washington come from um, the 20, I, I don't know the official name of the report, I should have it with me here, but it was a report that was published um, from ASWB in August of 2022 on the pass rates of the ASWB exam based on various demographics. So it was broken down by race, by gender, by um, age, all, all kinds Would of- Would it be possible to get a copy of that? Absolutely. That And I met a social worker back in January from Delaware, and she had the same kind of concerns about the bias and- uh, so I just kept saying to her, can you give me an example? But nobody has ever been able to give me an example of, of what, what the test is about. And I, do they have like three tests that you, you study on? And then go on if you yes, once a, something like that, I'd appreciate Once it. a person um, has been approved to sit for the test and then they sign up to do that through ASWB, they are given um, uh they are given a practice test that they can use. Yeah. Yes. If you could get some of that to us, it would be helpful for me anyway. So at least I understand it a little bit more. Thank you. I'll, I'll make sure you do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just have one quick question, and I don't know the sponsor. Maybe one of you all can answer this. This conversation has been going on in Maryland at, for the like past quarter, maybe six months that it really percolated and became a topic of conversation in all sorts of circles. Are we hearing this same conversation happening nationally? And is there work at the test site, the developers of the test, are they responding to the study and putting in work to address this issue? Because it looks like this is a national problem. And we're here in Maryland trying to solve it for our social work community? 
can uh, let me, I can just answer that um, it is being studied. There is a, a work group of deans, national deans of social work that are looking at uh, the exam, the nature of the examination, looking at the, the essentially the veto uh, quality of the test, you know, sort of wiping out, as I said early, they're looking at that. Um, there are uh, a number of uh, 16 states have uh, don't use or, or require the national test that some of them have an in-state test, some of them have other ways of doing it. Um, Illinois has just done it. And no, there's no um, no reports of any anything that has happened thus far. So it's definitely a national issue. We definitely need to work about it. But I'd love for you to share, for, for ASWB to share with you what they say they've done. All of the states use the ASWB exam for, for licensure right now. Um, I can speak to the efforts that ASWB is making. Um, I spoke a little bit about what's happening at the grassroots level, where nationally they are conducting community conversations with um, social workers, um, some who have passed the exam, some who haven't at various levels of their profession, um, and then at the leadership level through the Social Work Workforce Coalition. We've also changed to a three-option multiple-choice exam, um, which in terms of uh, test research, uh, we and, and our data release was was based off of the four multiple choice item exam. And now test research across um, all kinds of high stakes exams are showing that those four option multiple choice exams are more difficult to read in terms of readability and those types of things. So it'll be interesting to see when we release our data, you're, you know, at the next data point, um, what the scores are looking like now that we have a three option exam and that exam has already launched. Um, we are also, um, we review poorly scored items. Items are not all scored on the exam when a candidate sits down and takes the exam. There are sub, there are, I believe, four, 40 items on the exam that are pretest items. They're not scored. And so those items go through different types of uh, psychometrics. And then they come back to ASWB and we take a look at them. And any items showing bias uh, toward gender or race, uh, they are now deleted. Previously, what we had done was we had uh, taken a look at them to assess you know, what we think is going on. We might tweak the item and put it back on for pretest. Um, but now we just delete those items. So several changes have already been made and several changes are in the process of being made. Madam Chair, could I, I know just I just want to give you an example of, a, of, of kind of the quest and some of the bias. A number of the questions sort of start with a African-American blah, uh, or the, it'll start right off sort of setting up a, a, a racial or, or some kind of diagnosis straight up. So here's an example of one. If I could go ahead and let oh, them finish on the answer to my question. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I you got another bill coming up in just I'll a minute. You one. can get some more in in just a minute. Thank you. Susanna. Sorry. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to address exactly that issue of the things that currently ASWB is doing because of this um, release of the data. The community conversations around the country are being utilized as focus groups with all sorts of different stakeholders coming because not all, they want to know more about the user's experience throughout taking the exams and the barriers that they can identify to then address. They're looking at how to retool the exam right now um, so that some potential options right now are um, having different modules within the exam. And uh, um, as was indicated before, when somebody fails the exam, they're told which modules they did not do well in. So they are taking a look at the uh, potential option of having the person retake that specific module instead of the entire exam at a reduced fee. They are taking a look at the possibility of online proctored exams instead of having to go into test centers that may not be useful for people of all different abilities. Um, and they are also taking a look at the potential for um, sort of a case study of, you know, a constructed response of this is the scenario, how would you respond in this way? In looking at all of these different options right now, ASWB is trying to work very hard with the psychometric experts to ensure that whatever model that they move to is valid and reliable. And so that's one of the problems of people just propping up an exam quickly is that you can provide questions, but it not might not be reliable and valid in that sense, if that makes sense. It does. I'm sorry, did you? 
had something to add. I did. I also wanted to add that ASWB is not doing this work alone. ASWB is investing in independent research in order to ensure that this uh, that these efforts are data driven and that we can continue moving forward with a a uniform uh, national model that is supported by data to ensure that that any solutions that come forward are not solutions that re repeat the same problems that currently exist. Thank you for that. And thank you for those responses. Um, I have to tell you, I, I was fortunate enough, I passed by one point the first time I took the exam. I cannot, my heart was breaking as I was listening to the previous panel of people that have taken gone through this entire exhaustive process that we have to go through to even sit for the exam and then to get there and not be successful again and again. And then to learn later that it may not have been anything that they could have done differently or better to be successful. So please take the message back. This is a big, big problem and a big concern. Maryland is not alone, but we take this very, very seriously. And so we appreciate the work that's happening and ask you to keep in touch with us as things happen at the national level. And we're going to stay on top of this with the sponsor. So thank you very much for your testimony. That concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 871. Colleagues will now turn to Senate Bill 872. It's going to feel a little bit like deja vu. Senator Washington is presenting State Board of Social Work Examiners Temporary License to Practice Social Work. Hello again. Hello again. Senator. And you heard the you heard some of the, you know, the the problem. And so now we're, we we want to look at how do we re the reparations if we can think about it in that way. That's kind of how I see this bill in some ways. Um Madam Vice Chair, one of the exact I, I tried to find one of those temporary. So instead of the testimony I was going to do, I'm just going to read some of the questions um, because I think that that'll help that'll help you understand. Uh, so this is the one of the pretest questions for the LCSW, not the clinical one. It says a 12 year old African American boy has been meeting with a with a social worker for two months for feelings of depression. He recently discovered that one of his ancestors was a slave who had led a rebellion against uh, during the Civil War. He previously felt ashamed of his background, but in session starts speaking about his ancestors as being a brave leader in terms of racial identity development. This client's experience could be described best as A, conformity, B, dissidence, C, resistance, or D, introversion. What do you think the answer is? It's called D, I mean, B, dissidence. I might have chosen, and I probably some people here would choose resistance. You know, um, there's another one where uh, a social worker, uh, a, a woman, um, it says a newly social worker is providing outreach to a community that recently experienced a major hurricane. And again, uh, notice, there are a number of times where it says like a newly licensed social worker, and then it gives an example of an unlicensed social worker. Uh, there's all this sort of language uh, in the bill. I mean, sorry, not in, in the bill. Um, the, um, oh, sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll share this with you, um, but uh, here, okay, here's the one I was looking for. A social worker is attending a neighborhood block party. While speaking with her neighbor, the neighbor discloses that she was so frustrated with her child the other day that she hit her with a belt. While the neighbor is not a client of the social worker, the social worker should first, A, make a, suspe make a suspected child abuse report, B, report the incident according to state law, C, refer the neighbor to a different social worker so that there is no dual relationship, or D, contact the school to discuss the child. In this answer, it's B, report the incident to state law. Okay. So again, it goes, it's like, what are what are they, what are they measuring? Um, it the, the questions are on and on. Um, and again, this is not a um this is not a clinical exam, except there's lots and lots of questions about diagnosis and uh treatment. And again, I do think. Um, it's quite possible, frankly, I think with all the smart people we have in Maryland, that we could come up with our own exam uh, to properly assess what's needed in our state. Um, so um, 
the bill creates a fourth category, this bill, thank you, creates a fourth category of social work license, and it functions as a temporary license. And the only change to the license that makes it temporary is that it's removing the ASWB exam from the requirements for licensure. They would still uh, have to do the 3,000 hours if it was a master's level, if it was a clinical level, whatever it is. I appreciate the option of possibly removing it for the, the lower levels. Uh, employers may not discriminate against a, a candidate. They find out, if you find out if their status uh, is temporary, uh, a temporary licensure is not inferior to regular licensure. The state of, uh, state of uh, New York does temporary licensures. A number of uh, well-known quality states uh, have licensure. Um, temporary licensure would not uh, interfere with regular licensure. You cannot be paid less for having this license. Temporary licenses would allow more social work to enter the field. Now, the criticism, uh, I was jumping up a couple of times because what was just said was just simply not true. Um, this legislation would allow us to address licensing fairly, and it would strengthen, not impair the profession's legitimacy. It would, you can hire individuals with a temporary license, will not make employers more vulnerable, uh, more liable. Some of them suggested that. A temporary license would expire on the same timeline as a regular uh, a, a license. Uh, the formula the formula is incorporated in the state level and criteria for licensure. Uh, could be you could have a field that's added there. It doesn't matter what type of license it is. They all have expirations. You just add another one in, and it would have that extra. Um, you're still worried. Uh, in Comar, uh, provider means a healthcare practitioner or group of healthcare practitioners who are licensed. There's no mention that that you cannot, char you cannot um, uh, charge to uh, insurance or Medicaid. We've checked it out. Um, 16 other states uh, already offer temporary licensure. They all do billing. They all provide safe care. Um, there are uh, workforce. Uh, this, again, is a good way for us to address the workforce shortage. And it works in tandem uh, with the moratorium and workforce. And however you plan to, to do that, uh, frankly, I do like the idea of the BS, uh, some states don't even have a BSW um, license. Um, we could not have that, that could be a moratorium. There is the temporary licensure that these some of these uh, people could have uh, as they're preparing and if they decide to move on. So it could, it could work quite, I think it could work quite well. Um, I do have a panel uh, that is that is coming up to speak. That would be Tamika Bailey, uh, Teresa Hessler, Dr. Kyle Berkeley, and Maria Smith, and Rachel Doyle. So the temporary licensure would last two years, upon which time uh, it, it, it would expire just like any other license. Uh, there would be requirements. We're actually saying that the board could set the standards. We're not setting the requirements for the licensure. The board would set the regulations for what needs to happen in order to have the temporary licensure. Um, and there would, again, there would be accountability there. It would just function again the same. It would not reduce the number of supervised hours that they would need to complete. The point is that we now would have a vehicle for all these people who have been denied, have not been able to enter into the, the workforce through a process that, that the board determines to allow some set subset of them get into the path of earning, being licensed, doing what they love, as we as a group figure out over the next year or so how we should how we should address um, licensure in Maryland. And again, I assert that we have the ability as Maryland to determine what licensure looks like, what it means to be competent, and how we test that. The draft version, you've heard a lot about this compact. One, it isn't in, it, it hasn't happened yet. We need seven states. Who knows how long it's going to take for seven states. In the draft version, there is no requirement to take a national test at the moment. There is no requirement in the draft version. You can go onto the NSW website and see that it just simply does not exist. However, there's a lot of money uh, and a lot of interest 
that are very interested in pushing this state, this national exam, I don't think it's it's being set forth in the best interests of, of Marylanders or the, the profession of social work. Thank you, Madam. Thank you for the opportunity to share my experience and testify in favor of SB 872. I am a licensed clinical social worker currently serving as director of field initiatives with the Center for Restorative Change and a PhD student at Morgan State University. I stand before you today as a fellow social worker who has directly observed the harm that the licensing exam has caused for a number of my colleagues whom I've worked alongside during close to the, to the two decades that I've been in the profession. Despite graduating from fully accredited institutions where they completed hundreds of hours of supervised field work in at least two different settings, many of my competent and committed peers have still been unable to pass the master level exam. I've also witnessed other highly qualified colleagues who after completing background checks, building upon their skills through participation in regular supervised practice and successfully completing continuing education requirements have continued to invest massive amounts of money for test preparation and application fees, yet are still unable to pass the advanced licensure exam. In each of these scenarios, the efforts of my peers have been sufficient to demonstrate competency, yet these highly skilled, dedicated, and passionate individuals have lost jobs, been denied promotional employment opportunities, further contributing to the shortage of practitioners. The licensure exam in its existing state also places a barrier on achieving diverse representation in marginalized communities. The current process is not an accurate measure of competency. In addition to serving in the trenches with highly qualified peers who have been unable to pass the exam, I've also worked closely with colleagues who pass but lack necessary cultural humility, knowledge, and practice skills to be impactful. In many instances, I've observed these licensed social workers causing more harm than effective change in the lives of individuals, families, and communities of color. Based on the history of oppression in our country, uh, rep, uh, I'm sorry, based on the history of oppression in our country, uh, representation does matter in order to establish trust. I am in support of SB 872 because it promotes an equitable path to licensure. I'm sorry, Tamika Bailey. Hello, okay. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Ooh, can you hear me? All right. <laughs> Just wanna make sure you're awake, I know you're tired. All right, good afternoon, Chair Griffith and Maryland Senate Finance Committee members. Senate Bill 82, uh, excuse me, Senate Bill 872 offers long overdue relief to social workers, agencies, and communities in need. My name is Maria Smith and I live in Rockville, District 18. I provide virtual mental health services to individuals throughout the state of Maryland and received my MSW in 2014. My first job did not require a social work license and paid $40,000 a year. At the time, I paid $500 a month in student loans. Given my low salary and high debt to income ratio, my landlord wasn't sure I'd have $750 a month in rent. So I applied to be a licensed master social worker or LMSW to obtain a job that paid $50,000 a year. I passed the LMSW exam on my first try and received the promotion. During that same period of time, colleagues with much more experience and expertise struggled to pass the LMSW exam. Failing to pass meant losing long held employment and more vacancies for our agency. These colleagues were often bilingual, English as a second language speakers, and immigrants to the United States with families to support. Most were also older and a lot wiser than 24-year-old me. As I worked towards my LCSWC, I watched young, white, middle-class, female colleagues and I pass the clinical exam on our first try, resulting in competitive job offers. During this same time period, I once again witnessed bilingual colleagues, English as a second language speakers, this time children of immigrants, struggle to pass the clinical exam, all while often being more qualified to work with immigrant youth and families. So many people throughout our state are struggling right now. What a gift it would be to employers, employees, and communities in need to offer an immediate solution to the workforce crisis while also addressing a problem that has gone on for far too long. Thank you so much for your time. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Kyle Berkeley again. I won't um, need to hold two minutes. 
I will want, uh, I do want to point out I'm in favor of this bill. And there are other professions like counseling and nursing that only require one exam. Meanwhile, this profession has required two exams. Well, at my level, the LMSW and then the LCSWC. And you, you need the LCSWC to advance and make more than entry level. Um, meanwhile, somebody like me who has a PhD and only has the LMSW, even though I've taken the test more than 10 times, I provide training and I specialize in cognitive behavioral therapy, trauma-informed care, person-centered, um, I could go on. And I, I do trainings for people with LCs, even in the field, I do trainings. I've had some of my uh, supervisors present here tonight, uh, today as well, that can attest to my work at, uh, efforts. Uh, I've also specialized in research and harm reduction and published that. And in this field, you already have to work, you already have to do work at an internship that's unpaid and gain thousands of hours in this field before you even enter in it and then take the test. On top of that, after you gain your licensure, you have to get 40 plus hours of CEUs every two years. The reason why I say that is, sorry, I'm looking at the clock. <laughs> um, the, but the reason why I say that is there, there is no real fear of if somebody comes from a non-clinical background with the master's degree in social work and doing these hours and doing the field internship, et cetera, et cetera, that I just mentioned, where that's a fear. But if states like Illinois can pass legislation to support this profession and its communities that we serve, these communities include African-American, Asian-American, substance abusers, veterans, um, youth, um, disabled, my apologies, LGBTQ+, inmates, there's no reason why we shouldn't support this bill. Because the people that we serve are the people that don't feel reflected and aren't seeing people like myself when they want to see people like myself. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. My name is Rachel Doyle. I come to you as a lifelong Maryland resident, a human services professional for almost 20 years, a social worker for over a decade, and a clinical supervisor for the past five years. I am urging you to vote favorably for SB 872 to allow temporary social licensure without an exam. Amid a workforce shortage and a mental health crisis, we need more social workers, but our profession's biased licensing exams are keeping talented social workers out of the profession to the detriment of Marylanders across the state. I have personally provided supervision to talented black social workers who then struggled to pass these exams, hampering their careers for no good reason. Even though there is no evidence, some people do feel these exams are meaningful. I would say to them, I passed these exams and I assessed my supervisees as ready to begin their careers. Is my assessment valid or not? Conversely, I have met less than stellar social workers able to pass the exams, and I believe supervisors are better equipped to spot a poor performer than a 150 question multiple choice exam. It is abundantly clear that these tests do filter out social workers. However, rather than by competence, they filter by identity. ASWB has never taken accountability for their biased exams, and there's no reason to expect them to start now. I care about equity in my profession, but I became a social worker because I care deeply about equity for everyone. When we put harmful barriers in the path of social workers, it is vulnerable Maryland residents who suffer the most. These tests do not protect the public. Instead, they actively harm it. It is painful to watch talented, social workers flounder in the profession while Maryland residents suffer from a lack of access to services. Ballooning caseloads then burn out social workers already in the trenches and the cycle only gets worse. You can improve the lives of so many Marylanders by voting favorably for this legislation. These bills will give Maryland the opportunity to immediately pause the harm of the ASWB exams and work to find a better way forward for our state. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Teresa Hessler and I am here today representing the Maryland Association of Resources for Families and Youth, also known as MARFI. 
This bill is a major priority for our members, and we are here today asking you for your support on Senate Bill 872. And thank you to Senator Mary Washington for the legislation. If passed, this legislation would authorize the State Board of Social Work Examiners to issue a temporary license to practice. At this point, an individual has already completed schooling, training requirements, and background checks. They would still have to practice under a board approved and licensed social worker under the temporary license. As you will hear from many others here today in support, this is just one practical solution to the workforce crisis to use and to get people in the roles that we need to face this public health care crisis. It is for these reasons today that we are politely asking for a favorable report. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Imani Davis. I'm a student and master's in social work candidate at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. I am a future mental health clinician and I'm here to testify in support of Senate Bill 872. I'm here because this bill directly impacts me. I'm here because I'm a member of the demographic that has been named by ASWB. I, 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 I'm a member of the demographic that has been harmed by ASWB's biased tests. My heart raced the first time I learned Black women over the age of 40 have significantly lower pass rates than my white peers. My heart sank because they were talking about me. As I've begun to turn my eyes towards graduation and launch my second career as a clinical social worker, I've learned from multitude sources, multiple um, individuals, including a professor, and I quote, I should put my mind in the mindset of a 30-something or middle-aged white woman as I study to sit the LSMW exam. Do you know how gut-wrenching it is to hear? Even as I typed these words to share with you today, my whole body cringed with muscle memories of rejection known by too many who look like me just for showing up. And that was my somatic response. Imagine preparing for an exam by negating or pocketing your life's wisdom, which at this stage in my life, I've learned to trust more confidently. I trusted that wisdom at 40 something when I walked away from a career in international development, determined to apply that same energy domestically. I'm here because there's a shortage of Black female mental health professionals, and I intend to fill that need. As a future clinician, I want my clients to feel like they can bring their whole selves to the room. I believe authenticity to self is one of the pillars of self-growth. How am I as a future clinician going to sit with the knowledge that while sitting for my exam, I did so while imagining what I would do if I were not me, in my skin? I'm asking for your favorable report on Senate Bill 872. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I think we heard from the whole panel. I don't see any questions for this panel. So thank you all very much for participating in the bill hearing. I'm gonna call forward the next panel of witnesses, Frank Boston, Ari Plout, Tina Joyner, Lisa Klingenmeyer, Halavalu Vakalahi, Adam Schneider, Victoria Rodriguez, and Michael Massey. Okay, you can go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and uh, members of the committee. Just um, Ari Plout uh, here on behalf of Presley Ridge. Mr. Boston had to leave. He's attending a uh, graduation in Baltimore City for, for police officers. So apologies for that, but um, I'll continue. Uh, as stated in our early testimony, Presley Ridge is a, we're a private organization. We we produce social, social workers for foster care, uh, for treatment uh, for families and youth. Um, this bill, we support Senate Bill 872. This is very similar to a bill that you've heard before, Senate Bill 145. Uh, the only the slight difference is that in, in Senate Bill 145, if the test was unavailable, there's pursuant to an administrative delay, then the Board of Social Work Examiners would would then have the discretion to issue a temporary license. Whereas this bill is if there's it just if no one has taken the test or if they failed the test, and then the board would have the board will still maintain the discretion to issue a temporary license. 
Uh, we support temporary licensure for social workers. Um, as I stated, the discretion is still with the board to issue these licenses. Um, the industry, the industry, as you've heard testimony today, the industry, there's a, there's a shortage of social workers, and this is just a tool that will help assist in that. Um, prior testimony also stated that this is already being done in other states. Many other states already allow uh, temporary licenses for social workers, and Maryland also has uh, temporary licenses for other boards, such as the Board of uh, Occupational Therapists. So this is not would not be a new precedent. Um, also, one last point I'd like to make is that the uh, public industry, public industry of social workers, they already they actually employ social workers, but they don't call them social workers. They're unlicensed. They just call them casework specialists. So the practice is already being done in the state today. Um, and with that, I would just ask for your support on this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Lisa Klingemeyer, again with Catholic Charities of Baltimore, and I'm adjunct faculty member at the School of Social Work. Um, the previous panel already really laid out the, the real reasons why we need this legislation. I'll just simply say again, we want a robust, skilled, and diverse workforce. There's a clearly biased exam that's creating a barrier to that goal. So we should have some sort of temporary licensure in place for students who have gone through the education and gone through the training that they need while we take the time we need to re-examine that assessment. So for all those reasons, we strongly urge a favorable report on SB 872. Thank you. I'll start with a quote from the National Association of Social Workers from September 2022. The current exam does not conform with industry testing standards. Further, there is no evidence that the exam ensures competence or prevents misconduct or unethical practice. We cannot support exam requirements that result and unnecessary gatekeeping and discrimination. For these reasons, multiple pathways to licensure are necessary. That's our National Association talking. To say that either 871 or 872 are rashly considered is simply absurd. We've already established the harm these exams are causing and the lack of evidence to support their validity. This is over 40 years. That's 40 years of harm. The Social Work Board of Maryland has already demonstrated that they have no interest in addressing this problem. It has to be you. They have adamantly defended the exams despite the evidence. They endorse the idea that white people are twice as competent as black people to practice social work. Similar measures are being passed in other states. Just last week, Utah passed legislation eliminating the use of exams at the master's level. In 2021, Illinois removed the exam requirement for social workers applying for the LSW license. According to the NASW Illinois chapter, in the year before the law went into effect, only 421 social workers became licensed. Since then, 2,600 more social workers have become licensed with no harm to the public. Offer temporary licensing offers an effective stopgap measure that can bring folks back into the workforce and increase our numbers as new graduates emerge. Given what we know and our current context, it just doesn't make sense to keep this exam requirement. And SB 872 is the least we can do to address the issue. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members. Again, I'm Adam Schneider. Um, here in support of 872, I think we need to do more than just study these disparities. We need to stop them. And so I will say me too to the others. Hello, Madam Chair and uh, committee members. My name is Tina Joyner, and I am Maryland Association of the Deaf's Vice President. I'm representing here 1.2 million deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind individuals that live here in the state of Maryland. Currently, we don't have enough sufficient numbers of social workers to serve this population to meet our needs. But we're very concerned in our community because there's no direct communication in ASL, American Sign Language, with behavior health providers as well. Now, shortened to the point, it becomes, we need to expand the pool of social workers with temporary licenses, which will then be provided if this bill is passed. We feel that um, 
me as a deaf person pulling in a third party, an interpreter with a social worker, there's no confidentiality. I prefer one-on-one -on -one direct communication with my therapist or social worker. The more deaf social workers there are, the more empathy they will have. We breathe the same air. We have the same lifestyles. We have the same communication. Everything is the same with us. This bill will solve and create more opportunities for deaf, blind, deaf, and hard of hearing social workers to serve the 1.2 million deaf, deaf, blind, hard of hearing individuals in the state of Maryland. I'm asking you to, for a favorable, favorable vote on this bill. Thank you very much. I don't have any questions from the committee, so we thank you very much for your testimony and appreciate your participation in what has been a long day. So thank you for that. And we're gonna call forward the next panel, uh, Dion Bushrod, Brittany Barbara Alexander, Daphne McClellan, Stacy Owens, Terry Collins Green, and Christine Crone signed up in opposition to the bill. Good afternoon again. And you can go ahead and get started as soon as you're ready. Sorry. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm still Daphne McClellan, <laughs> Executive Director of the Board. I would like to apologize for the fact that none of my board members are here today. This, um, they had a disciplinary hearing, which required all of them to be present. And my board chair who had planned to testify um, is at a family funeral. Um, the legislative policy established in 19102 states that the General Assembly finds the profession of social work profoundly affects the lives, health, safety, and welfare of the people of the state. And the purpose of this title is to protect the public by setting minimum qualifications, education, training, and, edu and experience standards. I'm, I'm, I'm confused by the testimony of those who have supported this bill because I don't understand because the temporary license would still require that a person pass the exam during the during the two years of the temporary license. You would still be required to pass the exam in order to be licensed at the end of that two year period. Um, your employer would have invested a great deal in hiring you as a temporary licensed person. And then if you don't pass the exam in that time, what are, what's going to happen to you? As a board, we would then have the responsibility of investigating those people whose licenses ended without the person passing the exam, if they are still practicing without a license. Currently, every state requires an exam at some level as a necessary part of the licensing process. We are particularly concerned about offering licenses at the LCSWC level, which would not require one. This would make us the only state in the country not requiring an exam for the clinical license. It would create a license category, which would be confusing and questionable to many. Most importantly, however, a temporary license for LCSWCs is unnecessary. A person with an LMSW license can practice clinical social work under the supervision of a licensed clinical social worker. Currently, once an individual applies for the clinical license and meets all of the educational, supervision, and experience criteria, they are approved to sit for the clinical exam and have two years to pass it. The only difference between what this bill suggests and what we currently require is that the applicant must continue to have three hours per month of supervision until they pass the test. I do not think that this is an unreasonable requirement, and I hope that you agree. Thank you. Madam Chair, and members of the committee, uh, thank you again for your time today. Again, I'm Stacey Owens, and I'm testifying against SB 872 because I believe that uh, removing an exam requirement, even on a temporary basis, is a slippery slope to decreasing standards. I believe that it also poses a concern for social workers in Maryland who might later have the need or the desire to practice in another state. Um, as this would place Maryland as the only state offering a clinical license without an exam. Um, I'd like to share my personal story that I mentioned that I have been uh, licensed for 19 years total and eight years in Maryland. I was originally licensed in Texas and came to Maryland and actually had to uh, wait in order to uh, have reciprocity with my clinical license because at the time, the requirements in uh, Maryland were higher than the requirements in Texas. 
So there are many social workers who are in that position where they may need to move at some point. Um, if I had not been a federal employee, I would have had to wait in order to be eligible for the social work license in Maryland by doing extended uh, clinical hours. In Maryland, we do have a number of military affiliated families. So this would disproportionately impact uh, military spouses. I'd also like to respond to the uh, uh, sample items that were read earlier by Senator Washington. As someone who is intimately familiar with the development of the exam items, those items would not meet current standards to be included in an ASWB examination. Uh, those items do go through multiple levels of review and, and they would not make it to the point of being on an actual exam. Um, again, I urge you to consider the unintended consequences of eliminating um, a competence assessment and urge you to vote no on SB 872. Thank you. Good afternoon again, Madam Chair and committee members. I am Dion Brown Bushrod and I am in LCSWC here again representing NASW Maryland. If this bill was in response to disparity in testing data before changes are made to our profession, before we begin to give up on testing, one should ask, why is there such a wide range of disparity in the data? Can we focus on that problem? Or is this bill about using the data to promote workforce issues? The conversations jump from the disparity in the data to eliminating the test. There are a lot, there's a lot of space in between that. The disparity needs to be thoroughly considered to properly craft an equitable and just response. We oppose creating temporary licensure as the direct line response because the proposed solution does not match the problem of civil rights and social justice for entry into the field. Temporary licensure pacifies but does not correct issues with supremacy, privilege, and bias long term. Let's avoid a seemingly separate but equal mindset. As quoted by Whitney Young, who is an MSW and civil rights leader, what he said about civil rights is, we don't want equal, we want better. Issuing temporary licenses in our state not only creates a fifth level of licensure, it also creates two tiers of social work licensees, those who passed versus those who didn't, just like those who were grandparented in and those who took the test. Let's take a look at what we should have learned. Let's take a look at slowing down before we create major legislation. For all of these reasons and more, we invite you to read our testimony and we urge an unfavorable report for Senate Bill 872. Good afternoon, I'm Brittany Barbara Alexander, a licensed clinical social worker and a member of the NESW Maryland chapter and legislative committee. We firmly oppose this temporary license bill due to the unintended consequences that we just stated here. Um, from my perspective, this bill will create a two tier second class social work license that will create more disparity, division, confusion, and ultimately devalue what licensure means in our profession. This bill is incredibly harmful because it gives the illusion that more persons of color and others are able to obtain licenses based on another form of affirmative action. In reality, this bill, give, this bill will target the same folks who failed the exam at the highest rates, which are African-Americans, non-whites, English as a second language or older, second career social workers. They will end up without a license when it expires since it is temporary, and they will still ultimately have to take that ASWB exam. So this will also create a long-term issue for individuals who may want to be licensed in multiple states, or even relocate. They will not be able to be endorsed by other states because they will not have the test scores to transfer for verification or can even join that compact that we were talking about earlier. Our social work license is no different than any other helping profession such as LMFTs, LCPCs, psychologists, and psychiatrists. We also ask that you think about how this will affect the profession for non-licensed and licensed social workers long-term. It, it is a special privilege to have a license that gives individuals the ability and authority to involuntarily commit individuals and to be able to legally diagnose and provide therapy. Going into this field is a choice and so is seeking licensure. 
like all other helping professions. So we should not devalue our profession, but instead make the necessary changes to make this test more fair, equitable, and um, obtain more qualified ethical clinicians. For all of these reasons and more, we urge an unfavorable report for SBO 872. Separate but equal would take us backwards and not forward. Happy Social Work Month. Good afternoon, Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Klossmeyer, members of the Senate Finance Committee. My name is Christine Crone, and I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Clinical Social Work Coalition, sponsored by the Greater Washington Society for Clinical Social Work, which represents interests of more than 9,300 licensed so clinical social workers in Maryland. And, and on behalf of the coalition, we oppose Senate Bill 872. The bill language makes it unclear if the supervision requirement for the LCSWC licensure remains a requirement for a temporary license. For your information, the LCSWC is the highest level of licensure in Maryland. Current statute requires two years as a licensee with supervised experience of at least 3,000 hours. Components of supervision include guided practice, preparation, cultural competencies, evidence-based practice, consultation, as well as legal and ethical issues. The coalition strongly believes in gaining that valuable learning experience as a licensure requirement. Additionally, the bill would authorize a temporary license to remain valid for up to two years, and the coalition recognizes um, the delay in processing licenses, but feels two years is too long without supervision. For this reason, we oppose Senate Bill 872. Thank you very much, Senator Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just have one clarifying question to uh, Dr. McClellan. I guess I was looking up um, some more information about licensing for particularly for the the bachelor's level, the BSWs, and and you had said earlier that um, there was a concern that these that if you were to license um, the BSWs without an exam, that they could switch over to um, do clinical work. No, you but, must have misunderstood. I said, if we license a person as an LMSW, so okay. BSWs can never do clinical work. Right. 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 That was that right. Was no, no, I didn't. I, yeah. If okay. I said that, I, I I misspoke. I don't think I said that. But I don't, if if you if that's what you heard, that you it wasn't correct. Okay. So All right. I wanted to clarify that because <laughs> I think my point earlier was, could we at least allow the the BSWs to be licensed without an exam as part of this moratorium, but. Um, because they would not have the risk of being able to convert over to do clinical work. That's true that they wouldn't have that risk. I um, can't speak on behalf of what my board would think, but it's something that I could certainly take back to them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator yeah. Hayes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can one, one of you guys take a stab at, do you think um, having a temporary license uh, would have it less likely that an employer will hire and, and, and why do you believe that to be the case? I like to answer that. Right. Yes, because why would I choose to hire someone with a temporary license when I can hire someone who's passed the examination and has been practicing for longer term? That's a liability issue. If you're a private agency, why would I choose that person versus someone who has a permanent license? The work that you have to put in to onboard someone, the amount of money you have to spend to train them, and knowing that that's temporary and that can go away if they don't take this exam or if they should fail, that seems counterproductive. Right. That's why. But what what about in a case which we've heard testimony here several times that the the licensure test or it may not be available at that time? That was during COVID. That doesn't exist now. To my knowledge, people can fairly sign up online. So that previous bill, that was in reference to COVID. But now that's not an issue. People can sign up and get test dates wherever they want. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I don't see any additional questions for this panel. Thank you all very much for your testimony. Have a good evening. We're going to um, call, I, we're moving to virtual witnesses. We have Anita Bauzine. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, good afternoon, Senator Bidel and Finance Committee. Anita Buzion, and I fully support Senate Bill 872. My husband's military career brought us to Maryland for one last permanent duty station or PCS to Fort Meade in January 2021. I started working towards my LCSWC hours as soon as we arrived from overseas. As of February 2020, 
the requirements. My application has been mailed, it's been received, and I was told to wait 60 days for it to process. In true military fashion, my husband notified me that we're moving to a new state in three months. Unfortunately, the pass fail rate for persons of color are less favorable than other groups. I can't say that I'm going to pass the first time. I can say for certainty that I'll be able to find employment in June. Um, that will take a foreign entity to their organization with a provisional license. I can't say for certainty that the board will approve me to test within 60 days, within three months, or even in 2023. Sadly, my story is one. Military spouses <clears throat> have an experienced unemployment rate of 22%, making it one of the highest demographics in the United States. The delay in my independent clinical license means that I'm currently losing employment prospects and that my family's facing financial uncertainty. <clears throat> that I should be supporting my husband's transition out of the military into retirement. I'm only adding to the burdens that we already face during this transition. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, like financial and emotional stress. We all know that suicide rates among service members following separation is high, sadly. The passing of this social workers of color don't have the fear, um, won't have the fear the barrier that is posed on them when taking the clinical exam. As an identified indigenous Latina person, I, passing of this bill means that I can continue doing what I love, which is serving families in Maryland. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for sharing your experiences with the committee. I don't have any questions for committee members. So we'll go to our next witness, Cynthia Sagel, who's Siegel, who signed up in opposition to the bill. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Cynthia Siegel, and I've been a social worker for 27 years and had my LCSWC for 25 years. The majority of my career has been spent working with children and their families, both in foster care, on maternal child units of a hospital, and in private practice. I've often been the voice of those too young to have their voices heard. The impact of a social worker, that impact a social worker can have on a client's life is tremendous. And with that type of power comes great responsibility. The social worker is often seeing their clients when they are most vulnerable. It is the responsibility of the State Board of Social Work Examiners to ensure that each practicing social worker is ready for this challenge and needs a licensing exam to do so. Every profession needs to ensure there's a minimum, minimum level of competency before they put an individual out in the world who will affect other people's lives. Doctors, nurses, attorneys, and accountants are only a few of the professions that require their members to pass licensing exams before they can practice. Social workers are no different. Every social worker needs to study, memorize, and learn the material that will help them be the best social worker they can be. The licensing exam is a way to ensure that each social worker has a level of knowledge in multiple categories. This knowledge cannot be assumed by only meeting certain requirements and getting an MSW. It will be the clients who ultimately suffer. A lack of a licensing exam for the clinical level is even more concerning. Even if a social worker has had the appropriate amount of working and supervision hours, it does not ensure that they're fully prepared for the responsibility of being a clinical social worker. What was learned cannot be analyzed without a critical way to do so. Furthermore, if Maryland allows individuals to have a temporary license to practice social work without taking the exam, it will hinder them if they want to practice in another state. Social workers without permanent license will not be able to get licenses by endorsement, as many of the social workers in Maryland often work in the District of Columbia and Virginia. Thank you for your time and consideration of this testimony. And based on the statements presented, I request an unfavorable report to SB 872. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And there are no questions from the Finance Committee. So thank you for participating in the hearing. You are our final witness. Enjoy your evening. Colleagues, that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 872. We'll now turn to Senate Bill 608, Human Services, Maryland Statewide Independent Living Council, Senator Washington. Okay, um, colleagues, this bill is, um, thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate uh, the long uh, time you're spending on this issue. Um, this is a bill, it's already passed the House, um, it will enable the Maryland Statewide Independent Living Council to form as a nonprofit. The change enables them to apply for grants. Uh, it will allow them to restructure the council uh, so that they can meet compliance with federal standards. <laughs> I didn't know I had. 
Um, it will establish a partnership between the Centers for Independent Living and the new Statewide Independent Living Council. Uh, it will allow them to accept loans and just be, basically be able to move from just being sort of an advisory council to um, its own sort of quasi um, nonprofit and to continue to provide support to uh, individuals with disabilities uh, for their consumer control, peer support, self-determination and advocacy and to promote independence, inclusion, and non-discrimination. Um, I thank you and I urge your favorable support. I have two members, um, two members of the coalition um, to testify. Thank you, Senator Washington. Uh, my name is Mike Bullis. I'm the treasurer of the council and uh, I'm hopeful that this is, a, this is an easy bill for us. Uh, you passed Senate Bill 168, which is, does essentially the same thing for the Developmental Disabilities Council. The reason is that the federal government is trying to establish some autonomy and some um, uh, ability to operate without influence. And so this is the simplest way to do it. The council gets, uh, there, I should say, independent living centers in Maryland get over $2 million a year. There's an independent living center in every part of the state. And the council's budget annually is $139,000. That's all federal money. Um, and uh, so I think those are the basic points I wanted to make. And, and I know it's been a long day already, so I'll be quiet in case there, unless there are questions. Good evening, my name is Lorna Mae Silcott and I am the Maryland Statewide Independent Living Council's uh, secretary. I am here in support of Senate Bill 608. The Statewide Independent Living Council, a majority of whose members are people with disabilities in cooperation with Centers for Independent Living, develops and monitors across disability state plans every three years to enhance service delivery throughout Maryland. Currently, there are seven Centers for Independent Living, better known as SALES in Maryland. Um, they were established by federal law and work to enhance the civil rights and qualities for people with disabilities. Centers for Independent Living, a nonprofit disability resource and advocacy organizations located throughout Maryland, and they're operated by and for people with disabilities. So staffs and boards um, are 51% pe uh, people with disabilities. They are a part of a nationwide network which provides information and referral, advocacy, peer support, independent living skills training, and transitioning. Now, that means that individuals transitioning out of nursing homes and other um, institutions um, to transition back into the community and our youth and students who are in high school transitioning into the community and sometimes to college. The Centers for Independent Living are passionate about the people that they serve, and they also pride themselves on serving them with excellence. I thank you. And, and Madam Chair, I forgot to mention that I have two um, amendments that should be in your packet or will soon, uh, and it's to substitute the name Centers for Independent Living and just make it as a designated a state entity. And the other, you know, in line with, with uh, independence is removing um, a board of directors. Um, and instead that they, there will be, the council will function independently as it was originally uh, intended. And I also forgot to mention that House Bill 53, which is the companion, passed the House yesterday unanimously. Yay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, no more add-ons. Okay, okay. Right. very good. Thank you all very much for your testimony. We do have one virtual witness on the bill. I don't have any questions for the sponsor or this panel. So thank you for participating in our hearing. We're going to turn to our virtual witness, Melissa Blue Bow. Good afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Melissa Bluebaugh, and I am the Vice Chair of the Maryland Statewide Independent Living Council, or SELC. The Maryland SELC is an autonomous state entity that works with the Centers for Independent Living to increase and maximize the impact of independent living services in Maryland. The SELC is, comp is composed of governor appointed volunteers, a majority of whom live with disability. 
council members also represent di diverse cultural backgrounds and geographic locations. One very important distinction is that the SILK is the only cross disability advocacy organization in Maryland. In fact, Maryland is eligible for independent, federal independent living funds due to the existence of the SILK and the SILK's federal mandate to develop a three-year state plan for independent living or the SPIL. The SPIL is jointly developed by the SILK and the, the SIL executive directors to identify and outline the independent living priority priorities and needs of Maryland's citizens with disabilities. The spill, um, excuse me, the spill also designates how the funding will be dispersed throughout the state. Uh, one last thing. These independent living funds annually total over $2 million to benefit Maryland residents with disabilities like me. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much for your testimony. There are no questions from the committee, so we thank you for participating in the hearing and hope you have a good evening. And that completes our hearing on Senate Bill 608. We'll now turn to Senate Bill 509, Healthcare Facilities, Nursing Homes, Acquisitions, and Licensure, Senator Augustine. Good evening, everyone. I know everybody's so pleased to be here at five, whatever it is, on my birthday. So I'm really excited to be here with you all. Okay, I need a song real quick. No, we, we don't need a song, though. No. Sing it, no? Although we know you're a beautiful singer. Oh, how sweet. I love finance. <laughs> Whomever. Thank you. All right. Senator Malcolm Augustine, I am here on behalf of Senate Bill 509. Um, I do believe I saw Claudia was uh, here. Are you want to come up, right? Um, Folks, Senate Bill 509, Healthcare Facilities, Nursing Homes, Acquisition, and Licensure. Um, years ago, there was a company called NMS. They were a nursing home um, provider. They and they they were banned from doing business in our state because they employed a practice of like doing things like patient dumping, where they would put folks out on the street, out at bus stops. Those of us uh, or folks who've been on Senate Finance for a while, you remember, like they were just really, really bad actors. And so they, you know, they were thrown basically out from being able, banned from being able to do business in our state. And then three years ago, and I was talking about this with Senator Biden. Um, there was an expose by the Post. They uncovered um, events that had been transpiring at, um, uh, at this chain of skilled nursing facilities owned by a New Jersey private equity group called um, Porta Piccolo. And so in response to that, um, in the decline in the safety, quality of care for the, our most vulnerable uh, that were identified by the state regulators, uh, Senator Biden put forward a piece of legislation in 2021, Senate Bill 704. I was a co-sponsor. Senator Hershey was a co-sponsor of that. Um, that that really that that made sure that there were going to be increased inspections by the Office of Healthcare Quality on nursing homes purchased by out-of-state operators. And Senator Bottle has already reminded me that we have to make sure to get research on exactly what was been happening with that. But that's not what this bill is. This bill um, looks at these private equity firms when they are when additionally when they're making these purchases because the thing is. Interestingly enough, one of those principles from NMS, the group that had been banned from doing business here, became a part of a private equity uh, group that was purchasing, again, back purchasing properties here in the state of Maryland because they were kind of like behind the, 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 the veil of private equity. Um, 
And so there's just more work to be done. And so what Senate Bill 509 does is it calls on the Maryland Health Care Commission to share its findings with the Office of Health Care Quality, the agency charged with issuing licenses to nursing home operators. So Senate Bill 509 acts as a bridge between ownership and quality. The Maryland Health Care Commission provi will provide the detailed ownership information and past and current information on the operation of nursing homes located within, our, within or outside of the state to the Office of Health Care Quality. Um, when evaluating, approving, denying, or administering of provisional licenses. Uh, OHCQ will consider the findings of the Healthcare Commission. Um, they'll consider that and implementing this change would create an additional guardrail allowing Maryland to send a really strong message to outside owners that their quality track record matters when they're about to make a purchase. Uh, it's important to note that while private equity has been receiving a lot of the attention and we have kind of dealt with that uh, without a doubt, um, it's not just that. So there have also been real estate investment trusts that have gotten into this, um, and those ownership models are able to benefit from a lack of ownership and financial transparency that currently exists. It's kind of difficult for us to get a sense of exactly who is behind it. That's why, um, actually, in February, Biden administration issued uh, rule changes to require nursing homes to disclose more information regarding their ownership and management, including information related to assets held by REITs and private equity firms. So Maryland right now, just so you guys get a sense of kind of what this all is about, is fifth in the country for having the highest changes in ownership rates of nursing homes. Uh, there was a review, a federal review, nursing home ownership changes uh, found that in Maryland, 74 skilled nursing facilities, 33% of our total market, changed hands between 2016 and 2021. Uh, the data sums up, you know, to count of the change of ownership transactions so that one skilled nursing facility may have experienced more than one change, which we experienced, I know, in my district where it was changing hands and changed hands a couple different times during the study period. Um, but that the Department of Health and Human uh, Services report came to finding that the skilled nursing facilities with the overall lower quality score ratings were sold more often compared to the skilled nursing facilities with higher quality ratings. That's very important. Um, and so the report uh, finds that state's nursing home industry had 27 changes in, from 2020 through 2024 and in 2021. The, it is anticipated 10 nursing home uh, changes of ownership were to happen in FY22. The reality was that our change of ownership database shows that there are nearly 30 nursing homes um, that that did in fact change hands in 2022. So it was even bigger than what they thought it was going to be. And so far in this year, we're only in March and there have been seven nursing homes that have, have been added to the change of ownership list already. Um, and that's because we just, like I said, we just got this tremendous amount of turnover here in our state with regard to our nursing homes. Um, now we have actually worked with the Maryland Healthcare Commission, and we've received some of their feedback around amendments and things like that, Office of Healthcare Quality on this bill. And we, we, we really feel like this bill is going to protect quality of care and improve it transparency in our skilled nursing facilities. And I respectfully request a favorable report from the committee with the agreed to amendments from the, stakeholder, the state stakeholders. And I, so I thank you so much. And Ms. Blaylog is here to um, provide supporting testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> Sorry. Madam Chair, Vice Chair Klausmeyer, members of the committee, my name is Claudia Baylog. I'm the Assistant Director of Research with 1199 SEIU. We represent thousands of healthcare workers across the state of Maryland. We're here in support of SB 509 and urge the committee to issue a favorable report. So our members in nursing homes can attest to the declining quality of care when some owners, those who are driven by profit, cut corners to reduce costs. They may eliminate housekeeping positions or food prep workers or slash the benefits of workers like vacation leave or health insurance costs. Um, and all of this exacerbates the existing short staffing crisis that's documented in our nursing homes today. So we undertook a, you know, we, we studied what the MHCC was looking at when they're doing this evaluation of people seeking a change of ownership. Um, in the last year, the Maryland Healthcare Commission has identified over a 
dozen owner applicants with potential red flags in their track records. So yes, creating a stronger formal process for them to um, coordinate with the Office of Healthcare Quality on, on, um, on the information sharing and ultimately sending up a guardrail that says maybe you won't get licensed in the state of Maryland if your quality track record is indicating that you shouldn't be operating here. Um, and the Biden administration rules that are being promulgated were referenced um, by Senator Augustine. You know, the increased transparency that we see coming down the pike from the federal government on, on ownership changes and better cost reports from the industry will only serve to strengthen this kind of work that we're trying to accomplish here. The record pace of change in ownership in Maryland has impacts on the entire health system. We have strong evidence that changes in ownership impede collaboration between nursing homes and hospitals. This affects and challenges uh, our ability to address readmissions. It affects our waiver. So I want to thank Senator Augustine um, and everyone who helped to collaborate um, on this legislation from our state agencies. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have one virtual uh, person that is a part of the senator's uh, mm -hmm. sponsor panel. So you can proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Stevan Ellis. I'm the state long-term care ombudsman. And I'd like to thank the chair, the vice chair, members of the committee for hearing my testimony. I also, as an aside, wanted to say I'm very familiar with the NMS case and I'm grateful to the bill sponsor for uh, introducing this legislation. The Ombudsman Program is the advocacy program for nursing home and assisted living residents. As has already been mentioned, there have been significant changes in the number of facilities in Maryland that have had a change of ownership in the last few years. These nursing homes are often part of a nursing home company or chain that's required nursing home licenses and have gone through the current change of ownership or chow process. I always wonder how the providers were vetted for their licensure and would additional information make a big difference. For many years, the Ombudsman Program's number one complaint in nursing homes has been discharge and discharge rateably complaints. However, for the last three years, the highest number of complaints have been related to care. Care concerns are often related to the lack of continuity of care, lack of individualized care and staffing concerns. When companies change hands, these things happen, and it's because often there's changes in staff policy and leadership. When they're implemented in one facility, they're often implemented in many. And lately, the complaints indicate that these concerns are related to staffing. It is not uncommon for the ombudsman program to get complaints where folks wait for hours at a time and unfortunately have care concerns related to that lack of care. One facility in particular that I won't name who is, is part of a greater chain um, they have had hours of care, um, weights, uh, decreases in food, quality, palatability, and this has happened since this chain took over. And I wonder if there's more vetting prior, more information about how they did in other states. Would it have perhaps not caused these problems to happen? I really do um, hope that you will support this bill and consider my comments in support of it and give this bill a favorable report. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Senator Beidel has a question. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Senator, for the bill. My question is actually for Ms. Ellis, who I, I've gotten to know pretty well. Stevan, do you feel like you're seeing more, more claims or, or more issues in the nursing homes that are owned by investment companies than you're yes. seeing in our local nonprofit? Definitely. Yes, yes, I do. I, I do believe that um, it is due to cost cutting. Um, you know, I hear uh, that staff are telling me they're not making the same amount of pay as they would at other facilities, so they leave, and Claudia can comment more on that than, than I can, of course, Ms. Blake Baylog can, um, but the residents tell me that there's longer waits in those facilities, and then, as I mentioned in my testimony, because of that, they're not getting changed, they're not getting turned in position, they're not getting their pain medication, they're also seeing other types of cost-cutting measures you know, reductions in food, reductions in quality of food, the menus don't match, um, and then sometimes supplies. I also have seen, as Ms. Baylog has mentioned, that sometimes they'll cut housekeeping staff, laundry staff, and other staff where that that is not, uh, you don't have to release that information as a provider, whereas you have to have ratios of aides and nurses and that sort of thing. So, the, so a long answer to your question is yes. I do believe that it is often related to companies that are financially based 
that their uh, that their REITs or their private equity are they have that same kind of model where you see these cost cutting measures and I in my written testimony I submitted some references which I know some of the other um, people that submitted testimony as well did where you can get some sort of sort of uh, study information information from the press the GAO and also from Office of Healthcare Quality's website related to change of ownership so some fact based information that I think will be helpful. So do you see, I, we, I mean, there's staffing issues all across assisted living and nursing home, um, but you're seeing greater staffing issues in these investment kind of firms than you are in, in the other nonprofit firms. Yes, I believe so. I, I think that is correct. Just based on the complaints that we're getting recently, um, they seem to be more in the for-profit companies. And, and by the way, the transparency bill that was introduced a few years ago, it would have helped, I think, to know uh, if these companies really are private equity or if they're affiliated <laughs> with that or if they're uh, affiliated with REITs, um, because it's really hard to figure that out from the public available information. So that's why my question is, I believe so, but it's hard to know who actually owns these companies. Thank you. Thank you. For your Thank work. you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions for the sponsor or panel? Seeing none, thank you very much. We have additional witnesses signed up on this bill. Uh, Tammy Bresnahan, Eric Colchamiro, Jane Henderson, Dana Kaufman, Diana Jarek, Ben Steffen, Tracy DeShields. Good evening. You can get started as soon as you're ready. Still working? Yes. My name is Jane Henderson. I am the former executive director of an organization called Communities United, which is a grassroots membership organization of low-income Marylanders. I'm here today to testify in honor of Reginald Smith, and I'm going to try really hard not to cry as I do this. Reggie Smith was a longtime community not Community United member who died August 1st of a bleed out from his central line while a long term care patient at Manor Care slash, well, now it's Pro Medica in Rossville. I visited Reggie for more than four years as a because he was a member of my organization and he went, he was hospitalized. I was his family contact so to speak. And so I was the one they called on August 1st, my first day of my new job, to tell me he had died. The nurse I spoke with was honest and clear of exactly what happened. He was hooked up to an IV, which I believe was antibiotics based on my conversation with him two hours earlier. And suddenly blood started flowing out of him. There were several witnesses there who saw this happen, including a friend who was sitting chatting with him, who told me the next day she'd never seen so much blood in her life. Needless to say, staff and patients were traumatized. So imagine my shock when I saw Reggie's death certificate two weeks later that listed his cause of death as hypertension, diabetes, and renal failure. The medical conditions that had put him in the nursing home, but not the immediate cause of his death. In the days following Reggie's death, I learned that anyone who bleeds out in the state of Maryland, that case must go to the state medical examiner, which will determine whether or not that an investigation is in order. Because I was already thinking about an autopsy at this point. I spoke with that office every other day the week after he died. Of course, they never received any notice of his um, death. Um, they easily covered it up and any questions that might have risen. I know I'm over, but hopefully you'll give me just a couple more minutes. Um, uh, I continue to be in touch with Reggie's friends at Rossville. They tell me about terrible conditions that continue, things getting worse. People want to get out. They can't get services they need for rehab, and they're, so they're stuck in there. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out is that they, there are three beds in the room in every room in this facility. It's very, very not very small rooms. Typically, they didn't use the third bed in the middle, but they are now. And of the three women I was talking to, talking about how they can't even get all of their wheelchairs in there. Ma'am, I apologize. Oh, we've been here a really I, long course. day and we've got to vote. So okay. if you could just say, I love the bill or I don't like the bill. In Reggie's honor, I hope you will pass this bill. I just want to say one more thing and that 
I want to, while they blame the nurse and they fired the temporary nurse who was managing his IV, I blame this facility. Okay. He got that central line last December for emergency day dialysis. And he didn't need it. It should have been gone May, May or April. I'm so sorry. very sorry for your experience. And we do appreciate your testimony, but we do have to get some things yes. done. I, I apologize. I know it this sounds is like a human was, cost understand. Of, of these investments. Understood. First. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here and sharing that experience. Thank you, Chair Griffin. Members of the committee, Ben Stephan, Executive Director of the Maryland Healthcare Commission. Uh, I will be uh, quite brief. The Healthcare Commission uh, supports this uh, piece of legislation. Uh, for the last several years, uh, we, uh, on our monthly update to our commissioners, update them with the what are called determinations of coverage, which are basically uh, statements that a acquisition does not require a CON because the services and facilities are not changing. There's no CON requirement, but we do point out to the commissioners that uh, in, in cases where the applicant, if that applicant were to come forward with a CON, would not meet the uh, quality and character requirements. We can't do anything in the case of uh, purchases, however, uh, but we do alert the commission to that to those situations. We think that this is an appropriate, uh, although quite small step uh, in addressing the issue of acquisitions. I would note, you, you likely will hear from some people that this is a dangerous uh, act. Uh, it will inhibit the market for nursing home acquisitions. Maryland is a robust market for nursing home acquisitions for three key reasons. First, our Medicare Advantage market share relative to other states is very small, currently about 21%. Medicare Advantage plans negotiate very hard uh, bargains with nursing homes. Not such a challenge here. Two, we have relatively favorable Medicaid reimbursement rates for long-term care. And three, we have a relatively uh, prosperous population, meaning high percentages of, Medicaid, of nursing home beneficiaries residents are actually purchasing it out of pocket. So it's an attractive market. We shouldn't be afraid to put additional pressure on potential purchasers. And we should think about this when these acquisitions occur. Who benefits? Uh, obviously a seller does. Obviously a purchaser thinks it's a good idea. There's an opportunity for a, a return. And three, theoretically, a customer does. And we need to keep those customers in mind as we think about how we're going to change the statute. Thank you very much. Sorry for going over. Good evening. My name is Diana Jarek. I'm an attorney at the Public Justice Center, which is a not-for-profit civil rights and anti-poverty legal services organization. I know it's quite late, so I'll be very brief. Uh, we're in full support of this bill. We're um, very eager to keep bad actors out of the nursing home acquisition business, um, and we believe that facilitating the information sharing between the entity that inspects these facilities and the entity that grants licensure is a great way, um, a great start, rather, to doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Senator Beidel. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm going to try to make this brief, but to Mr. Steffens, please. So the bill that we passed in 2021 that um, Senator um, Augustine referred to required surveys to be done more frequently when a, a, um, a nursing home was purchased, one in, one in 90 days and one four months later. Do you have any information on how those surveys were done, you know, what the results were, or is that OHCQ? That is OHCQ, and it's done after licensure. So, I mean, it is remediation, but uh, it's after licensure. So stopping it at the point of licensure is key. So we, we talked about that actually in 2021 when I was working on that bill, and there was this big pushback about, oh my goodness, if we push too hard, then no one will buy the nursing homes and the nursing homes will close and we won't have any place for the people. Sounds like that has changed, that sentiment has changed. I think that there is sentiment uh, among some of the regulators, but that's not my position. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any additional questions for this panel? Seeing none, thank you all very much. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your story, your thank experiences you. with the committee. Thank you all for your testimony. Colleagues, That that is our final panel.
I have no additional witnesses on the bill, so that will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 509. We're going to take a five-minute break, and then we'll do some voting and then get you all on your way. <laughs> 